The 2019 election campaign is underway. In a world of constant surprise and deepening uncertainty, Canadians will elect a new parliament on October 21st. And tonight, Maclean's and City TV are bringing you the first national leaders debate of the 2019 campaign, now with 25% fewer leaders. We've invited the leaders of the same four parties we invited the last time you saw me here in 2015. Three of them accepted. Elizabeth May, the leader of the Green Party. Andrew Scheer, leader of the Conservative Party. And Jagmeet Singh, leader of the New Democratic Party. We also invited Justin Trudeau, the leader of the Liberal Party. He declined, which is absolutely his right. We left the invitation and his podium open right up to airtime. Why have a debate without him? Because in Canada we elect parliaments, not presidents. Every major party can influence the next four years and every party has a case to make and to defend. And in Canada, the right to ask questions is never bestowed by some authority. It belongs to everybody. Tonight's format is simple. The night's divided into four issue areas. The economy, indigenous issues, energy and the environment, and foreign affairs. I'll ask each leader a question on each issue. That leader will have a minute to respond before we open the floor for a free-flowing debate. All leaders have agreed that I can intervene at any time to follow up, ask new questions, or clarify where appropriate. So let's begin with our first issue, the economy. City News reporter Janella Massa sets the stage for us. Canada's jobless rate is at near record lows. Wages are on the rise. Borrowing money remains cheap. But Canadians are still feeling squeezed. We will not accept our services being shut down. In our biggest cities, a hot housing market has made it hard to scrape together a down payment or pay the rent. Never mind saving for retirement or paying for tuition. Meanwhile, many with well-paying manufacturing jobs are nervous. It's scary. I picture a closure of the plant within three to four years. And there are fears recession is around the corner. How will Canada weather another downturn while still carrying large deficits and paying off debt from the last one? As a business owner, we want to see control over the budget. I understand it has to be spending, but who lives beyond their means all the time? At the local Rotary Club meeting in Toronto's Scarborough Agent Court riding, the economy is top of mind. They promised that the deficit would be controlled, and then I, the, the number that they projected was really small, which surprised me. But within a couple of months, it was totally overboard. And, you know, that is really money out of each individual person's pocket. Many of the members in this potential swing riding are business owners themselves worried about how federal decisions will impact the futures of their industries. My concern is the uh, fluctuation in tariffs and the different things going on with the different countries that are somewhat outside of the control of the Canadian government. We haven't signed the free trade yet. Uh, you know, we need to get some stuff done in order for our customers to feel confident that, uh, you know, to go ahead with uh, their, their business plans for the future. And we're here with the members of the Rotary Club to watch tonight's debate. After we hear from the party leaders, we'll check in with them and get some reaction and hear what they thought of what the leaders had to say. And the first question on the economy goes to Elizabeth May of the Green Party. Ms. May, your economic ideas aren't widely known. You've called for a guaranteed livable income for every Canadian. Now, the Parliamentary Budget Officer reported in 2018 that a similar guaranteed basic income program would cost $43 billion a year on top of the cost of the existing programs it would replace. Is that realistic? Yeah, hey, Paul, let me just do a shout out to my fellow Rotarians who are watching, and I pledge to abide by the four-way test at all times, uh, should I become Prime Minister or in the rest of my political life. Our plans are very realistic. We have submitted our budget and our plans to the Parliamentary Budget Office. Our planks are being costed. In the case of guaranteed livable income, it's a project that will take some years to bring into place because we need to negotiate with every municipality and the provinces. We need to set the guaranteed livable income at a level which is indeed livable. And we know that across this country, that's a different measure. But we'll be able to wrap up and end the programs. Now, the Parliamentary Budget Office is only looking at the costs with the programs that they identified. There are other programs that PBO missed in that analysis, plus the benefits to our health care system would be enormous. The reduction of basically uh, housing people in the most expensive housing possible, which is in penitentiaries, $100,000 a year per prisoner, instead of making sure that we invest early in eliminating poverty in this country. We can afford to do it. We can't afford not to. Okay, thank you for that, Ms. May. 
Andrew Shear, does that sound good to you? Well, you know, when you're talking about adding uh, tens of billions of dollars, $43 billion uh, to the cost of government, that all comes from somewhere. That comes from the economy. Uh, that means that there is less prosperity and less growth, less economic activity that lifts people out of poverty. And in the preamble to the question, we heard a lot about the effect of that deficit. And we've seen what uh, long-term permanent deficits have done to this country in the past. Justin Trudeau promised that the budget would be balanced that the budget would balance itself this year. Instead, we see massive deficits as far as the eye can see years into the future. That puts a huge strain on our social services like health care and education. And it means that right after the election, he will raise your taxes when he doesn't need your money, but he still needs your vote. Conservatives are focused on creating economic growth. That is what truly lifts people Mr. out of Sam. poverty. Sure. I mean, we heard from what's going on in Canada. We know that people are struggling. I meet people every day that are worried about the future. They, they tell me that they're not sure if they're going to be able to make ends meet. I've met moms who are struggling because they're worried about if they can provide for their kids. I met seniors who can't afford the medication they need. And really, the, it all comes down to one thing. Governments in Ottawa, whether they've been conservative or in this case, particularly with Mr. Trudeau, the Liberals, governments have always made decisions, it seems, that make life easier for the richest and hardest for everyone else. And we've got to change that. That's why we believe in investing in people, making sure we build a healthcare system that includes medication coverage for all, that we make sure that seniors never have to worry about the cost of medication, I'll that the young that. families just, don't have to worry about the cost of finding a home. If I could just correct you on one point. Uh, I'm not the sure you can. conservative government, uh, our tax cuts overwhelmingly benefited low and middle income Canadians. Under Justin Trudeau, life has become less affordable. It's harder Let's and harder for people to get tax cuts. We, we know that with tax cuts, Mr. Sears real, tax cuts, what they need real is tax cuts for the wealthiest, in wages but that means cuts to families income. that are struggling. But, but if I think That's back what it to where, Andrew okay. start, where you started, Andrew, you're right. We have to find money for these things. That's why the PBO is costing a platform that for us includes increasing taxes on the wealthy, eliminating the loopholes that overwhelmingly only benefit the top 1%, stock option loopholes capital gains, the ways in which we deal with money in this country, we can actually find much more revenue. We don't tax Google or Facebook. They no, take billions out of this economy. Just we can raise the corporate tax rate to 21%. I, I want to touch we, on one thing that Mr. Shear just pointed out, that he said he was going to cut taxes. He would certainly cut taxes. There's no question about that. He would cut taxes for the wealthy, and he would cut true. services That's for families. That, that is, is exactly what conservatives we do. Have made, We've we seen have made it here a, in... Well, I'll just let me finish my point. We've seen it here in Ontario. Mr. Ford... Promised to cut taxes, he did. He cut taxes for the wealthiest, nice. and then he cut services for made, families, autism I funding, have made, education I have made a funding, firm commitment. all the things that families Mr. rely Singh, on. He with cut. all due respect, Mr. I have made a firm commitment that under a conservative government, I will ensure that funding for health care and social services continues to increase. But those services are threatened. If you want to talk about Ontario, we can see that Justin Trudeau is trying to do to Canada what Kathleen Wynne and the Liberals did to Ontario when they ran massive deficits that put strains on our public services and led to higher taxes. But if we're going Under to that for type of program, our federal government will find it harder and harder to fund those programs. And the only way to pay for that is through higher taxes, Mr. which Shear, will make life have to less bring in universal pharmacare is the best way to reduce costs in our health care system. Hurt the, only to ahead, the only way to help people get ahead, the only way to help people get ahead is to leave more money it's in their pockets. To that comes from a government and cut lives and within its means. Needs. And we okay, really need, we need 100% universal pharmacare. That's the best way to control health care costs. Well, we've We've started a pretty good uh, debate tonight already. Uh, let's go to our second uh, question. And this one's for Andrew Scheer, the leader of the Conservative Party. And all the issues that you have raised in the last few minutes are going to come up later in the debate. Um, Mr. Scheer, new Conservative governments in two large provinces this year, Alberta and Ontario, have discovered worse than expected deficits requiring bigger than expected spending cuts. If your new Conservative government were to discover the same situation at the federal level, would you cut spending? or push back your target for a balanced budget? And if you'd cut, what would you cut? Well, I'm confident that we will not have to encounter those scenarios because we are going to have a fully costed platform that will show Canadians how we will get back to balanced budgets over a responsible period of time, five years, which will allow us to maintain increases in important services, to important services like health care and education. We will run a government that lives within its means so that we stop borrowing money 
we see more and more Canadian taxpayers' dollars going just to pay the interest rate on that debt. Uh, under Justin Trudeau, tens of billions of dollars have been added to the debt, and that means more and more of your hard-earned dollar is going to pay banks and bondholders for that debt. By getting back to balanced budgets, we can lower taxes, put more money in your pocket so that you can get ahead. That is what this election is all about. Who do you trust to make life more affordable and help you get ahead? Our plan will do exactly that. Should With Singh? all due respect, uh, I, didn't Mr. Singh, hear, I didn't hear an Mr. answer from Andrew. Yeah. Mr. Singh goes first and then we'll open it okay. up. Sure, That's thank okay. you very much, uh, Paul. Um, let's be really clear. When Conservatives talk about cuts, to taxes, they're going to cut services. That's exactly what they do. Here in Ontario, people have felt it. They felt the cuts. Those who are most vulnerable are seeing their services cut. Kids who are living with autism, their, their services have been cut. What we believe is that Mr. Trudeau, same thing. He believes that the priority should be making life easier for the wealthiest. I believe it has to be different, and we can do it differently. We need to invest in families. Our plan is, by 2020, to expand our health care system to include medication coverage for all. I met a 10-year-old kid, and he told me that he lived with chronic illness, and he wasn't worried about his chronic illness. He was worried about how much his medication cost his mom and dad. A 10-year-old kid felt like a burden. I want that 10-year-old kid to know that with our plan, he will not feel like a burden. The fact of the matter is Conservatives in the past have got Canada back to balanced budgets while maintaining historic increases in investments for health care and education. That is our track record, and that is it's our commitment going into the future. Uh, Ms. May actually has a point. The question was, in the event of a surprise, which priority goes first? As do you said, push back a balanced budget, a ba balanced are, budget, or do you cut deeper than you would have? Uh, we have planned made to. a commitment to get back to balanced budgets over five years. We are going to control the rate of growth of government spending. That is how we are going to get back to balanced budgets. Oh, we have wow. seen record levels of spending. We are going to maintain those levels. We are also going to eliminate wasteful liberal spending, like the two hundred and fifty million dollars that Justin Trudeau sent the Asian Infrastructure Bank to build roads and bridges in other countries. We're going to repatriate that money, and that's how we're going to get back to balanced budgets. We're going to do it. At the same time as increasing so, health care and education transfers. I have been very clear on that. That is a firm commitment Elizabeth so just, that we can I'd lower like taxes and put more money in the pockets of Canadians. Okay, by coincidence, Mr. Scheer and the Green Party have the same target for balanced budgets within five years. We have a lot of revenue coming in from new streams, including putting a surcharge on banks' profits, bringing in higher taxes on large transnational corporations and many others that will be in our platform. But if I were faced with the choice that you just put to us, I would not cut spending and services. We need to massively expand services. We need 100% universal pharmacare. Jagmeet's right. We have to bring in pharmacare. We're the only country that has universal health care that doesn't have pharmacare. And we need to eliminate tuition so our kids can get a good start or at any age improve your education, experience the best you can be, and we need to fund post-secondary uh, education much more significantly I mean, so, we so do you, now. You put budget balance well back in your list of it's priorities. It's not ideological. Okay. We, yeah. we yeah. aim yeah. to live yeah. within yeah. our yeah. means. It's clear families are struggling right now. We, we recently heard that uh, nearly half of Canadians are just $200 away from not being able to pay their bills. Because Justin now, Trudeau's made Mr. life less Mr. affordable. Mr. Trudeau is going to make, or Mr. Trudeau has already made life more unaffordable. He's promised a lot and not delivered. He's hurt families by neglecting. Mr. Scheer is going to do even worse. He's going to promise you a couple extra dollars in your pocket, but it's going to hurt because he's going to cut all the services you depend on. That's just not we true. believe you in investing in those services. We know, we know what conservatives do. We've seen them do it in Alberta. We've seen them do it in Ontario. Mr. Scheer is going to do the same thing. What we believe is, why don't we tackle one of the biggest concerns people are faced with? And that's the housing crisis. To do that, we need to tackle speculators and money laundering. But also needs it also means we've got to invest in building homes, quality the, homes. And we're committed to building 500,000 new homes across this country. The Mr. issue Scheer. is that... When times are good, that is the time to pay down debt so that there's more flexibility. There are some very troubling signs on the horizon that Canada may be heading into some difficult periods. And unlike the previous Conservative government that paid down debt to give us flexibility, that allowed us to be the last into recession and the first one out, we are going to hit those difficult times in a very difficult p position without that type of flexibility. That increased debt costs taxpayers. It means more of your hard-earned dollars is going to pay banks and bondholders. We want to get back to 
to balance budgets you know, so that we can put that money it's back into services that. and find new ways to lower it's your taxes. It's funny that you mentioned that, Mr. Shear, because your government in the past has consistently benefited the wealthiest. It has not it's worked for not people. The Mr. Trudeau has done the same thing. Mr. Trudeau continues the most to make decisions that benefit the people at the very top. comes from the parliamentary budget I didn't cut you off while you were talking. No, people at the very top. I didn't say things that aren't true. People at the very top continue to be benefited by Mr. Trudeau and by Mr. Shear. What we need to do is make laws and make rules that actually help people out. No, We've we got to put people at the heart of our decisions. A, we we know the tax conservatives to aren't going to do that. Mr. Trudeau certainly hasn't done it. He hasn't shown up for four years for people. He hasn't think, shown up today for the we debate. I think that's what we need to do is stand up for the people. Let's take on the powerful interests. I think we need to examine our home tax code. I think I found some consensus. Our tax code is so confused. I think I want to hear that. Andrew Shear, what's the consensus? I think I found some consensus. I think we can all agree that Justin Trudeau is afraid of his record, and that's why he's not here tonight. He has made life more expensive. Might be the only thing we agree on, but we'll agree on that. Well, we can agree on that. Well, I'm glad we agree on the hard points. We can now sing Kumbaya and keep going. The next question is for Jagmeet Singh. Mr. Singh, you're promising a huge expansion of health care in Canada, a so-called head-to-toe approach that would include dental care, pharma care, eye care, home care, long-term care, all written into the Canada Health Act. How long will that take and how will the limited tax increases in the NDP platform cover the cost of all that? Uh, it's about choices, Paul. Uh, we'd make different choices. We look at some of the decisions that Mr. Trudeau has made over the past year. He gave $14 billion away to the wealthiest corporations so they could buy corporate jets and limousines. He bought a pipeline for $4.5 billion. That's almost $20 billion that he committed to the wealthiest and the most powerful. We'd make different choices. I think about a young woman that I met in London. Her name is Jessica. She's a single mom. She's pregnant, and she's got medication that she cannot afford. And I think about what she's going through, and I say, you know, she shouldn't have to worry about the cost of medication on top of the other fear she has. So what we want to do is bring in universal medication coverage for all in one year by 2020. And we're going to sit down with all the premiers across this, co across this co uh, pro country and say to them, when it comes down to your health care, with the same amount that you're spending right now, we'll back that up with $10 billion to fund every single person in your province. We know that unlike Mr. Shear, who says 95% of Canadians are covered, they're not. We're going to cover you because we're in it for you. Elizabeth yeah. May, I saw you nodding. Well, I agree about with, with uh, Jagmeet about universal pharmacare. It's essential. We can't afford not to do it. But I do, I am troubled by the numbers because I wanted, we, we try in the Greens, Greens support working towards coverage of dental. But when we went to PBO five, four years ago to check out the costs, it came to $30 billion and we realized we couldn't afford it. So our platform, which is fully cost and will be released soon, looks at providing dental right now for low income Canadians. Because I don't see how, Jagmeet, I don't see how you found the money where, how, your budget, as, as Paul said, it doesn't reflect the kind of costs for universal free dental. Universal health care through pharmacare is essential. It'll help us bring down costs. It'll save us billions of dollars a I year. But, de but we can only afford low-income dental. Let me respond to okay. that then. So, I mean, we know that uh, dental care is something essential. I mean, dental care, dental health is not something we can separate from our overall health. And we believe we can't afford not to invest in dental care right now. There's far too many Canadians that can't afford their dental care, and they end up in hospitals, and they don't get their their initial problem treated because there is no dental coverage. We believe we can do it. I've met so many families that are struggling with the cost of dental care, and it's a commitment of ours. We'll start with Pharmacare for All, and then through revenues including closing offshore tax havens and mm -hmm. other loopholes, making sure we ensure we that those at, at the very those. top it, you, and the fair share, share you we briefly on all these programs. You know, you, you cannot increase health care services when you're paying more and more money to pay the service charges on the debt. And that is what all these plans will lead to. Higher and higher taxes, which take money out of the economy, which means that there's less economic growth, which means there's fewer opportunities for people trying to lift themselves out of poverty. Every dollar that goes to a, a bondholder or a banker for the debt that they hold is another dollar that you can't put in to expand those services. That's why it's important to have a responsible plan to get back to balanced budgets. That's how we're going to lower taxes to leave more money in your pocket. And it is true I don't that know up to 95 percent of 95 percent of Canadians I can't believe you're doubling down on this false are eligible for pharmacare. I'm going to give you some advice here. Pro tip: Don't double for, down on that. Are eligible look for you last time. prescription drug coverage, and that is why a, a government should be focused on those people who fall through the cracks. That well, that's why we, we, we need to provide to fill in the gaps. Maybe in the your world, you're right that we need to cover, but provide. in the real world, Canadians are not covered. I'm going to call an audible here, folks. We've we've certainly seen some stark differences among you on on these issues. I've got a question that doesn't fit into our issue areas, but that is one of the questions of the week. 
League, um, which is Bill 21 in Quebec, mm -hmm. um, which will uh, forbid public servants, which for today forbids public servants from uh, wearing religious um, uh, signs, uh, including teachers. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Premier of Quebec, Francois Legault, said this. He's calling on all of you to stay out of that uh, debate and not to challenge it in law. He wants you all to make an undertaking, not just for now but forever, to never challenge that legislation. Quebecers, he says, have decided. He's going to get what he wants, isn't he? It was May 1st. I find it very distressing. Bill 21 is clearly an infringement on individual human rights. We also have a situation where our federation, as, and as a as someone who believes I am competent and fully able to be Prime Minister, I take it very seriously when I look back at our history of divisions with, within this country, separatism within Quebec, I don't want to fuel. I want to work to find a way that ensures the rights of every Quebecer wearing a hijab or a turban or a yarmulke, that they're actually protected. And it may be that we can find a solution where we leave Quebec alone, but we find jobs for anyone that Quebec has taken off of their payroll for working in a government job and how you qualify kindergarten teachers as a government job, never mind. So you we give jobs to people who have to leave? Yes. Andrew Shear. I made my views on this uh, position uh, very clear. Uh, the Conservative Party will always stand up for individual liberties. We are the party of the Bill of Rights. We are the party that supports uh, individual expression. Uh, we, this is not uh, something that we would ever think of imposing at the federal level. And uh, right now, people in Quebec who are opposed to this uh, legislation or affected by this legislation are pursuing it in the courts, as is their right. And ultimately, the courts will make a decision on that. A Conservative government won't join them in the, in the court? Uh, we're not going to intervene in the case. The people who are against uh, uh, this bill are doing that. They are using the courts as is the right, and the courts will ultimately decide on that. Jagmeet Singh. You know, I think about what this bill says to, to a lot of kids out there that have made to feel like they don't belong because of the way they look. I remember when I was made to feel like I couldn't do things because of the way I looked. This is a law that effectively says that not just do we discriminate people maybe in society, but now it's legislated. It's legislated discrimination, and it's sad, and it's hurtful. And I think about all the people that wanted to pursue becoming an educator or maybe wanted to become a lawyer or a judge and how it's telling them that they are less worthy and they don't belong. Um, what I do, I recognize that this is within the jurisdiction of We've Quebec. We've got to wrap it up. There's an important challenge going on right now, and that's an important challenge, and I support that right to challenge this law in court. Uh, I'm hoping that I can send a message to people in Quebec that you can believe in who you are, you can celebrate your identity, and contribute to society, and I'm hoping that I can send that message. Okay, so everyone going to court against that law in Quebec, these leaders wish you luck. And that concludes our discussion of economic issues and a couple of others. To get reaction and let you know how you can get involved, We'll be taking a few mid-debate breaks with our City News colleagues. Here's Melanie Ng in Toronto. Thank you very much for that, Paul. A lot of people are chiming in online. In fact, this hashtag, First Debate, is trending number one on Twitter in Canada. But we are also taking your questions, getting your reaction. Poll. We released this poll earlier on in the day, and this was the question we were asking you. Are you planning to vote in the federal election? Overwhelmingly, 87% saying yes, 13% saying no. We'll keep this poll open, but we want to bring in a new one, and this one is on Twitter. Here's the question. Of the four debate topics, what is the most important issue to you? As you know, we are discussing four major ones here. Economy, foreign policy, indigenous issues, energy, and the environment. So that's going up on Twitter right now, and you can have your say. We'll check in in about 20 minutes' time. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, we are bringing in the pros. Aaron Brindle from Google Canada is a trends expert. He'll be following the analytics throughout this debate. And Dilshad Berman is part of our digital team here with City TV, City News Toronto. She has also been seen shooting some behind-the-scenes footage on Instagram where the leaders were arriving to our building here in Toronto, as well as some of the supporters who are standing by there. So don't forget to vote. We'll check back in with you on these polls. Meantime, we're going to check in with our Janella Massa, who is standing by in the eastern part of Toronto at the Rotary Club. Janella. That's right, Mel. And we heard from some of the folks here at the Rotary Club just at the very beginning of the, de the debate and heard some of their concerns. I want to bring back Gil, who spoke with us earlier. Uh, what did you hear that jumped out at you? We were talking uh, about the deficit and some different approaches to that. Well, right off the bat, I think uh, Mr. Trudeau has, uh, is conspicuous by his absence. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think he did himself any favours there. I noticed that uh, Mr. Singh is, is trying to uh, uh, portray Mr. Scheer as a, a Ford uh, conservative, um, and I don't know how that will carry. I know 
Miss Meg, uh, kudos for her being a Rotarian. Uh, <laughs> but I think her spending uh, projections, uh, the, I don't see how they could possibly cost that out because it, it talks about uh, there, there will be so much um, spending done. As my colleague last week was saying, mm -hmm. you can't just keep spending, spending, spending without uh, having some way of paying for it. So. Uh, that would be my big worry between Mr. Singh and Ms. May, and uh, that's uh, that's my initial <laughs> initial reaction. thoughts. Thank yes. you so much for sharing that, and uh, we'll send it now back to the debate. Indigenous issues have rarely been at the center of as many national debates as they've been over the past four years, from pipelines to clean drinking water, to the inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, with its 231 recommendations or calls for justice. That's why we've decided our second topic tonight will be indigenous issues. And I'll warn the leaders right now, I'm going to be a little bit more interventionist in making sure you don't talk all over your, your, your one another. It's good to be excited, but we, we have to be comprehensible too. Andrew Shear from the Conservative Party, you get the first uh, question. Mr. Shear, last week the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal handed down a decision that could force the federal government to pay $2 billion in compensation to First Nations children harmed by the on-reserve child welfare system. Would you appeal that decision or accept it? Well, I would certainly acknowledge that the federal government has a unique responsibility as it relates to First Nations and especially Indigenous children, both on and off reserve. Uh, it's very important that these uh, that the programs that are offered to young Indigenous people give them the exact same opportunities that every single other Canadian has. Uh, it's very important that uh, federal government works in partnership with First Nations communities. I've got a great relationship uh, with uh, Grand Chief Perry Bellegarde. He actually comes from my home riding of Regina Capel. Uh, that's why our government, uh, our Conservative government, will be focused on practical things that can alleviate the types of challenges that are facing Indigenous Canadians. Uh, that includes ensuring that we end long-term boil water advisories, that there are partnerships in place so that people on reserve and off reserve can have access to the same types of jobs that other Canadians do. That means saying yes to important natural resource projects that give people an opportunity. Uh, we will, of course, abide by uh, court decisions and see uh, the types of impacts that has on our abilities to provide those programs, but of course we're going to be there as a willing partner. Ms. Bain. Yeah, I'm pleased to hear you say, if I did understand your answer, that you will fully enforce the new ruling from the Human Rights Tribunal because we have seen millions of dollars in wasted legal efforts to quash the efforts of Cindy Blackstock and the Child and Family Services and Caring Society. This is a huge victory for the work that's been done to protect Indigenous children with the Canadian government fighting them tooth and nail. And the things you've mentioned to Andrew are essential but not at all sufficient to meet the challenge of truth justice and reconciliation, which means committing to the full thing, as we do as Greens, completely fulfilling the requirements and the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the Murdered and Missing so, Indigenous Women's Inquiry. We will do these things, and that's just the beginning of working for real justice, which means allowing First Nations, Indigenous, Métis, and Inuit societies that self-identify, they decide who's a member of their community, and we begin to let uh, and encourage that we have communities and nations opt out of the Indian Act okay. so we can end this structural violence that I is our current sure, system I want to make sure I understand. In the case of a human rights tribunal decision like this, the federal yeah. government has 30 days to decide whether to refer it to a federal court. That's right. Which means that guy, the prime minister, w w must make that decision during this campaign. Yes. You would argue that he shouldn't refer it to a federal court? He must agree? immediately accept that this is long overdue and Canada will fulfill long in a period of injustice towards Indigenous children. We have more Indigenous children okay. in care now than at the height of the residential schools. This is a crisis. Mr. Shear, how would you respond? It's essential that the the outcome of these types of decision actually gets the resources to the people that need it the most. And ensuring that this type of uh, decision uh, focuses the federal government's efforts on creating those ta same types of opportunities that every other Canadian has is the essential part here. Uh, it's I, I didn't Mr. hear if you would accept the ruling or not. I, this is Indigenous kids that are that are not getting equal funding. The Human Rights Tribunal of Canada has ruled. And Mr. Trudeau certainly hasn't listened to rulings in the past. He's appealed four or five times yeah. previous rulings. Now, Mr. Shear, it's not surprising, but it is appalling that he hasn't said that he would accept the ruling. Let me be very clear. Yes, a new democratic government would accept the ruling. At a minimum, we shouldn't be taking indigenous kids to court. They deserve respect and dignity. That's what reconciliation is all about. 
at a basic level, we ensure that there's equal funding. We also ensure that there's clean drinking water, there's access to quality homes. Then we make sure that indigenous people are treated as equal partners in decisions. I mean, I'm appalled that Mr. Shear couldn't just say, yes, we wouldn't appeal the decision. On, uh, on the broader question, don't rulings like this um, demonstrate how much uh, expectations and frustration have increased uh, even in only the last four years. And Mr. Scheer, doesn't that make it a, a much greater governing challenge than it was even the last time a Conservative was in power four years ago. No, you're absolutely right. And uh, if there's one area where Justin Trudeau raised expectations to uh, yeah. levels that he has been a complete disappointment on, it is on Indigenous files. Uh, we have seen, uh, you know, the disdain that he has shown people that he had promised as it relates to Grassy Narrows, uh, an important improvement in the health care services on the, to those people, and the disdain and uh, dismissive attitude he had to those people who are advocating on their behalf. I think we can all agree on that, that the fact that there are still so many places in Canada where Indigenous children can't drink the water, it, where they don't have the access to... to uh, with all to due respect, opinion. Andrew, it was Conservative senators that blocked the passage of the bill that passed in the House of Commons that we should honor the United Nations Declaration on the Rights for of Indigenous very, People. For Those very are your people no, for in very important who did that. Reason. For a very important reason, Ms. Because Mayor, they wanted why. to block no, Indigenous rights. Because they in that bill, in that bill, there is a provision that would force governments to recognize that in order for big projects to go ahead, the types of jobs creating projects that give people you opportunity. You actually would have Sorry, to give me, prior and informed consent. Free, prior and informed Correct. consent. And that means that we would have tremendous uncertainty. It means that if right, there were right some... Now, sorry, sorry, if... Right let me now finish. This is very important. If, you can't actually if get there communities are outside, indigenous communities who want a project to proceed, they would be vetoed if there were some that were opposed. And part about respecting indigenous rights Res means respecting the right to say yes. And we do not live in a country where any one group free, of people might be have a free, 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 prior, and informed consent is the reason the Conservatives stopped the bill? Free, prior, and informed consent. Does that mean, free, prior, sorry, and does that, mean that you need unanimity for big projects we to go ahead? We signed on in the United Nations to the United Nations Declaration are, of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The government under gonna, Justin Trudeau said are, we would live up to I'm it, and we passed in, it in Parliament. There, there are very, there are I'm, I'm going to jump ahead of the next question because this thing that moderators dread just happened. You started debating my next question before I got a chance to ask it, but I think it works out well. The next question is to Jagmeet Singh, and it's on Bill C-262. Mr. Singh, your colleague Romeo Saganash uh, spent his last months as an MP promoting his private member's bill, 262, which called for Canadian laws to be brought into conformity with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. That bill died in the Senate because of Conservative opposition. Basically, let's keep going with this debate. Beyond the symbolism of that bill, how would it improve the daily lives of Indigenous people? Well, it's a pretty transformative piece of legislation. It, what it essentially says is that we should treat Indigenous peoples with respect as equal partners. And it's something that we haven't seen by Mr. Trudeau. In fact, uh, Mr. Scheer alluded to it, but I want to just spell it out. You know, there, I went to Grassy Narrows. This is a community surrounded by lakes and rivers, a beautiful community surrounded by water. And the people who live there wake up every day and look at those lakes and rivers knowing that those lakes and rivers are poisoned by mercury. Now, people who are deeply concerned about the poisoning of their water, who suffer the impacts of mercury poisoning, which results in shakes and dizziness, they, they live in that with that threat. Some of those activists went to a private fundraiser, and behind closed doors we saw the real Justin Trudeau. And what he did was he mocked activists who were concerned about poisoned water. He mocked them, made fun of them, and then people clapped and applauded. That is what you get with Mr. Trudeau. I mean, these are people that deserve justice and fairness, and that's why I would implement the declaration. But most importantly, I would assure that clean drinking water, clean homes, access to education are a right, and we would establish that. Mr. Shear, on the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, again, this is a very important provision. It's there are many laudable goals within this piece of legislation, many things that the conservative, a conservative government will support, that I will support as prime minister. But we cannot create a, a system in this country where one group of indivi individuals, one indigenous community can hold hostage large projects that employ so many indigenous Canadians. Mining, for example, is the single largest employer for indigenous Canadians. We, if this bill is implemented, we will see the complete blockages of large projects that build the types of prosperity. There were That's over 37 
partnerships agreements signed with the Northern Gateway Pipeline Project. There are many Indigenous Canadians who will benefit from Trans Mountain. And, and yes, there really, are people no. who are opposed <laughs> it, but we do not live in a country where any one group of people have a view. Exactly. The language you are you using is so inappropriate when talking about Indigenous Canadians. You are missing the fact that Section 35 of the Constitution already is interpreted by the courts, goes almost all the way to, to what the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Is when much you, consulting than is not, I will consult with you till you agree with what we've already decided to do. The courts That's been, not consultation, and the, it's not, it's what Trudeau thinks is consultation, it's obviously what you think is consultation, uh, but it has well, to be free, you know, prior, informed just, consent. I, I, it is true, Mr. Shear, though, that the judge in the Trans Mountain decision last, last year said that a duty to consult doesn't mean waiting until the people you're consulting stop talking no, right. and then do what you want. No, you're, you're absolutely right. The judges and the court decisions on this have been clear. The duty to consult means real consultations. It means dynamic consultations. We saw the Trudeau Liberals fail to do that properly. It means that we where saw the appropriate, where appropriate, fail to do it too. those concerns, need to, be, those concerns you're, need to be, those concerns need to be addressed. But it does not mean that any one Indigenous community or another can hold up projects if they happen to disagree with it. We have to live in a country where we can have the types of confidence from investors to build things things to get people working. That so is the second. only way to build prosperity the, for Indigenous Canadians. So, so that's not at all what's going to happen. First of all, you use language like hold hostage. I mean, that's just incredibly disrespectful off the well, top. You tell that to no, the no, dozens I of communities you, who have I listen to you, sir. been left out sir, because they don't have the opportunity to, to work. Now, you've got a what, what happened is he, he's talking as if he doesn't understand the reality. You're going to have to work with communities. If you don't have communities buying in, projects won't go ahead. And it's a matter of respect and dignity. And we should move forward with respect and dignity. It's, in fact, better for business. If we ensure that we have a process that we know is going to work, we're going to work with communities and make sure that they feel engaged, involved. And yes, that means they can say no. And yes, that also so means happened? they can say yes. So what it happens means we in the event? work together. And partnership is the only way forward. We can't have Mr. Shear's so approach which is to ram projects through. What? So, so, so please, make sure people so, agree and that so communities are behind it. What, hap what happens if one Indigenous community says no? We're talking nations, not communities, not groups. What happens, the language you what are using, Andrew, shows one no Indigenous respect. community says no. You okay, we have to work May, does, not, does, does the Conservative leader not have a point? Is there not um, division among Native nations yeah. over some of these projects? First to say that when, when Andrew tr tries to deflect the reasons that they stopped the acceptance of the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People and ignoring the Section 35 requirements that are already there. He threw it that, well, Trudeau did it wrong on Trans Mountain. Okay, Harper did it wrong on Enbridge. Same thing. We have governments that think that consultation is to keep talking at Indigenous nations until and groups until they agree. Now, in the context of territorial recognition, you can't treat in Indigenous Canadians as though they were a an interest group or a lobby. The rights that they have in the Constitution and which we as federal leaders have a fiduciary responsibility to protect, even under the, Section 35, much less under UNDRIP, require a, a rootedness in territory. So the territory of the Squamish and the Musqueam and the Tsleil-Waututh will be irrevocably destroyed if Trans Mountain goes ahead and That's there's right. a single Dilbert leak, That's a right. single one. That's right. Let's uh, move on there because we will be spending a whole block later talking about pipelines. So I, I, I want to go to my last question on uh, Indigenous issues specifically, and that question is for Elizabeth May of mm -hmm. the Green Party. Um, Ms. May, in interviews you've suggested that if SNC-Lavalin were found guilty on corruption charges, the company should be ordered by a court to perform community service by repairing water infrastructure on reserves. Did you mean that as a serious proposal? And if you didn't, what's your real policy for improving on-reserve infrastructure? Well, of course, our policy on on on-reserve infrastructure is that every First Nation and every Indigenous community should have drinkable water, and that's a responsibility of the federal government. So the connection to First Nations around my approach for SNC-Lavalin is just one example of what could be done. Let's be clear. SNC-Lavalin needs to go to court. The DPA agreement is still hanging out there, and after the election, whether it's a Conservative or a Liberal sitting in the PMO, they are all riddled with influence from SNC-Lavalin. Let's not in, forget. No, they have SNC Lavalin had its tentacles right in to the civil service at the most senior level at a way that requires an inquiry. But what do you do to protect the workers? Okay, that's what that's Justin Trudeau's excuse. Got to protect the workers. Well, the workers have it. The corporation has billions of dollars of existing contracts. There is no evidence that jobs are at stake. But if you wanted to come up with something creative, which could not be Green Party policy, it would have to be up to a judge to say, I'd like to order this company to do community service, do the work that needs to be done, 
Maybe in transportation infrastructure in a downtown. Maybe fixing the water line under the Fraser River from Mission BC, which if it's 38 years old and it's already showing cracks, someone has to pay to do that work. Why not make SNC-Lavalin do it, but no profit, no profit line in the work they do. Mr. Singh, your MPs were quite critical of this idea. I mean, it's, it's a bit ludicrous to suggest that we should be building public infrastructure through punishment of a multi-billion dollar corporation it is a ludicrous idea. We should, be, we should be building public infrastructure through public dollars. We should be investing in not P3s where profit is the motive, but where we publicly own it. I took the profit out the of it. That's the whole proposal. I mean, we shouldn't be proposing that uh, a private company do it that Who way. Who do you think builds infrastructure, infrastructure on First Nations? A, we should have a public tender and a public tender should be providing the services. Listen, but the public First tender Nations, goes to private corporations. We, no Singh, one would ever suggest that in thought, a city like Toronto, that if the water was not clean, that we would ask a corporation as punishment to clean it. We would clean the water. I mean, okay. people across but, this country deserve but, clean but water. But your, your First MP Nations issued on your, on your letterhead, the NDP issued a press release that was a fat, big fat lie, claimed I wanted to privatize water infrastructure. The Green Party doesn't support P3s. The Green Party is against privatizing it, it infrastructure, idea, fully you, against you, you it. You can just accept it. It was a bad idea. Well, it, it certainly was misinterpreted, it, and, and it's not off. policy well, of the Green off, Party. You started off the question on a very topical note, and that is Justin Trudeau's corruption scandal as it relates to... Uh, SNC Lavalin and the fact that he broke the law. He is the only Prime Minister that has ever been ever been convicted of breaking the law, and he lied about it. And now we find out that the RCMP is looking into this case with the view to possible obstruction of justice charges, and he is obstructing their attempts to get the truth. So I want to use this opportunity to again call on Justin Trudeau to do the right thing and waive full cabinet privilege and cabinet confidence to allow people to testify to the RCMP so we can get to the bottom but of this issue. don't you agree with me that we need a full inquiry? I don't think we're going to get an RCMP inquiry is internal. I think we need the equivalent of a Gomery inquiry because we have to get corporate influence out of government. SNC-Lavalin is not the only large transnational that can get people in PMO and PCO what to jump when they say idea? jump. I, I think it absolutely is right. That's what we started with when we were first asked the question. We came out and said there should be a public inquiry. But I want to make something really clear. Whether we have Mr. Trudeau in government and a Liberal government or Mr. Scheer in government, at the end of the day, both these parties, they continue to make it easier for the rich to get ahead. That's their priority. So it wouldn't have been much different. The PMO's That's office, if it was a Mr. Scheer office, would have got the call directly from SNC. All the wealthiest corporations know to either you donate to liberals SNC or donate 10th, to. That's not true, and you know it. You uh, met with they, they your donate to either conservatives met with or they donate, officials donate to liberals well. because they know there's it's a, either those parties. I think I'm so uncorruptible. SNC Lavalin never asked to meet me. There's a there's a there's a pretty simple test of your attitude towards SNC, Mr. Shear. If you become prime minister, will the public prosecutor be permitted to decide whether SNC continues to trial? Absolutely. The core of this issue is whether or not we want to live in a country where powerful politicians get to pick up the phone and tell prosecutors how to do their job. Okay, the whole, and the, the whole root of this is that Justin Trudeau didn't like the answer that his attorney general gave him, so he fired her. That is I, a huge attack on the independence of our justice system. And I can hear so many people saying right now, this was supposed to be about Indigenous issues. So I do want to ask... Mr. Singh, Mr. Shear, Ms. May, if, uh, if, if there's time, um, because you've already been uh, addressing the question, how do you fix um, uh, dirty water on, on, on Indigenous uh, uh, communities? It's, a, it's, a, it's an intractable problem, it seems. It's a huge problem. Uh, Paul, I, I don't see how in a country as wealthy as ours, in the year 2019, with the technology that we have, that there is any excuse for clean drinking water not being available to everybody. Uh, I reject any excuse. I reject any sort of plausible denial that this is not possible. It is possible. We have the resources. What we've lacked is the courage to do so. Mr. Trudeau jumped quickly to give $14 billion to the wealthiest corporations to buy corporate jets and limousines. He jumped quickly to buy a pipeline. If this was a priority, it would have got done. With new Democrats, we would make this a priority. And we're we're use nearly out of time. all the resources so, and get it done. Mr. Shear, same question. Yeah, it's, this is a, a huge issue and one that a conservative government will take seriously. I will absolutely ensure that I sit down with Indigenous leaders to find uh, ways to address this. It means investments in infrastructure on reserve. It also means training uh, people on reserve to be able to maintain and, and upgrade and, and, and manage these types of facilities. That's a partnership that I'm willing to engage yeah. in. It's Briefly. straightforward. Water infrastructure in Indigenous communities needs to be owned 
by Indigenous communities. And the workforce that keeps that system working needs to be from people in the community. The ownership with top-notch equipment will ensure that every community has safe drinking water. Okay. That concludes our discussion of Indigenous issues. I'll be back in a minute with the leaders. But for live reaction and a chance to join the conversation, here again is City News host Melanie Ng. Thank you so much, Paul. Yes, a lot of people chiming in right now, especially on Twitter. I want to bring out the results for a Twitter poll we put out about 20 minutes ago. Of the four debate topics that we will be discussing tonight, what is the most important issue to you? Overwhelmingly, there are two. The economy at 52% and energy, the environment at 38%, and then foreign policy and indigenous issues at six and five, respectively. But you can continue to chime in on this poll. Meanwhile, Elephant in the room. A lot of people are asking, where is Justin Trudeau? He is, in fact, in Edmonton in a riding that he is hoping to take from the NDP. So this is just some video from him previously on in the evening. We'll talk more about this and show you some more highlights coming up. Meanwhile, I want to bring in another poll for you, and this one is going to be via Facebook. This is how you can chime in. Does a leader's debate performance affect how you vote, or lack thereof, because we're not seeing Justin Trudeau here. So have your say. We're going to put this on our Facebook page right now. Meanwhile, we're going live to Courtney Terrio, who is an Enoch Cree nation just outside of Edmonton, speaking with First Nations chiefs. Thank you very much, Melanie. Uh, we are here on Treaty 6 land with the chiefs from the Alexis, Nakota Sioux, Saddle Lake, Enoch, Ermiskin and Frog Lake, as well as the Grand Chief. And uh, we're going to do the lightning round because there's a lot to chew on here, and we'll get to that a little bit later on in the post-debate show. But right now, two questions, lightning round. Who impressed you the most throughout the Indigenous portion of this debate, and how would you describe it in a word or two? Courtney, this, was, uh, this is an important election, and the First Nation people need to, and Indi Indigenous people need to participate and make sure that we're, we're catching up on the information, uh, participating in the talks, and we have to be prepared to get out and vote. Okay. Who do you think, who, who impressed you? None really. Um, oh, my, first, my first thought was you can't make chicken salad out of chicken droppings no matter how you stir it. I hear a lot of fluff. And it's the same fluff that's been going on for years and years, and there's nothing about equal resources of native communities. All right, we do have to hurry up here. Uh, Billy, get you going. What's, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I think uh, as opposed to the winner, I think there's a loser, and that's Mr. Shear, who can't give a straight up uh, answer to a straight up question. And I think the actual winner is Justin Trudeau because nobody else is standing uh, out when it comes to Indigenous issues. It sounds like a lot of rhetoric again. Okay, Grand Chief Little Child. Yes, uh, likely uh, in a similar vein. I'm not impressed by only, uh, any of them. In fact, I'm very unimpressed by. Uh, Mr. Shear continuing to misrepresent what the UN declaration means. All right, and uh, just get a winner because we are cutting time. Who do you think most impressed you, real quickly, gentlemen? I guess for myself, <clears throat> it would be Elizabeth May, but then uh, um, I'm more interested in Justin Trudeau's uh, speech, see what he has to say. Okay, Chief Desjardins, who impressed you, real quick? I would like to say uh, NDP Singh just because he touched on some uh, very important issues that are important to us Indigenous people. All right, there you go. Just a taste of uh, the discussion that we will continue a little bit later on uh, post-debate here on the City News McLean's debate. Right now, though, we're going to turn things over to uh, Cynthia, who's back with our political analyst panel. That's right, Courtney. I have some great political minds at this table with me. Amanda Galbraith, who's a principal at Navigator. You've also worked with conservative governments. Andre Domis, contributing editor to McLean's. Lisa Kinsella, you are a liberal commentator. And John Geddes, who is the bureau chief in Ottawa. John, what are your thoughts so far? Two out of the three leaders here. It's their first debate on the federal stage. Yeah, and I think the most important dynamic we're seeing so far is Andrew Scheer starting out hoping to push the focus us all off this studio and out to Justin Trudeau. He'd like to be attacking Trudeau, mm -hmm. but then Jagmeet Singh bringing it at cheer, making it very difficult for him to do that. So I think so far Jagmeet Singh is is directing a lot of the fire and, and doing it quite effectively. And I think it will be interesting to see if Andrew Shear can somehow bring it back to a, a different okay. dynamic later. Lisa. I, and I think that's true. I think Jagmeet Singh is doing exceptionally well. He had a job to do tonight and he is doing it. Okay, Andre, I, I'm sorry, I've got to cut you off here. I heard a couple of really concerning things. One is that Andrew Shear seems to believe that Canada can just unilaterally violate treaties 
with unceded First Nations territories. And Elizabeth May just keeps floating this idea that she's going to punish SNC Lavalin should they be convicted of, uh, of a, a felony or a crime uh, by making them do uh, community work in First Nations. I, I just, it's Please stop. Just stop. Sure, right. Amanda, I'm going to give you the final say. I think Andrew Shear's holding his own and sort of speaking directly to voters. He's very calm. I think Singh's a surprise for all of us. He's a lot stronger than He's I thought he was going well. to be. Mm -hmm. Very scrappy. I think Elizabeth May is proving why her party should probably have her campaign a little less publicly sometimes. All right. And on, <laughs> on that note, I'm going to send it back to the debate and Paul Wills. Four years ago, despite its extraordinary resource wealth, Canada was struggling to get pipelines built. And despite all the headlines about climate change, the country seemed unlikely to hit its targets for emission cuts. Today, all of that is still true. Our next topic of conversation is energy and the environment. Setting the stage for us, City News reporter Tara Overholt. The federal carbon tax. We put a price on pollution because it shouldn't be free to pollute anywhere in this country. It sparked hope in some. I think it's a great idea. Anger in others. It's an exceptionally and profoundly stupid idea. And created deep political divisions. We cannot afford the risk of a carbon tax recession. To scrap the carbon tax cash grab. It's the cornerstone of Ottawa's strategy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But complicating the government's goal of fostering a green friendly image stark reality of Canada's economy. Fourth largest exporter of crude oil in the world. Billions of tax dollars now invested in pipelines and more than 800,000 Canadian jobs linked to energy. In Calgary, I met with just a few of those workers who have seen the good times dry up. For all of us here who have watched our friends struggle, uh, maybe be out of work for numerous years or struggle to find meaningful work, they're underemployed if they are employed. It's uh, something that's very, very personal and very important to me. All three feel that the industry is misunderstood by many Canadians and under-supported by the Liberal government. The lack of energy knowledge is, is really hurting the country. The importance of it and the difficulty of which it's going to be to convert to a different energy system. People just don't seem to grasp the magnitude of that. You need a plan. You need to think this out. A recent Angus Reid poll highlights the challenge for political leaders. Canadians want the government to make climate change and oil and gas development top priorities. I think we need to talk about economy, we need to talk about energy, we need to talk about the environment. Uh, even within the energy industry, we don't talk enough about how most of us are so informed and so care we care so much about the environment. So I do think we need to find a way to find a balanced conversation and reunify the country. The first question on energy and the environment goes to Jagmeet Singh of the NDP. Mr. Singh, after your party lost a by-election to the Greens in Nanaimo this spring, your candidate Sven Robinson called on you to abandon your support for the LNG Canada mega project. That's a $40 billion project with hundreds of jobs attached to it. It's also has heavily subsidized by Justin Trudeau's government and by British Columbia's NDP government. Do you still support it? What I support is the fact that British Columbia is a province with one of the, the best climate action plans in the country, one of the best climate action plans in Canada. And they've made sure that everything they do is going to fit within their bold climate action plan. And I support that. Uh, what I don't support is Mr. Trudeau and his government, who has absolutely no plan to include something like the Trans Mountain into their, into their projects. It is disrespectful to Indigenous nations. They haven't considered the potential risk to the beautiful coastline in BC. One spill of a diluted oil bitumen could result in massive devastation. And I think about what's at stake. We know that we've got to move to an economy that is zero emission. That is the future. We know we've got to go there. I remember a mom that I met who told me she was worried about the future. And I asked her why. She said, I'm worried about climate crisis. And she had a baby in her arms. She said, I'm worried yeah. about the future because I'm worried if my daughter will be able to breathe the air on some days in British Columbia because of the massive forest fires. We have a real crisis and we have to have the courage to act. I want to make sure I understand. If you form government, if you have the deciding vote in a minority government, that LNG Canada project goes ahead because the NDP government of BC wants it. Uh, what I can tell you is that we would immediately end all fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, we believe that those fossil fuel subsidies need to be ended and we need to be investing into clean energy. That would be our commitment. Andrew Shear, you get the first response. 
Well, it's always been the case that the NDP don't support developing our natural resources. What we now know is that neither do the Trudeau Liberals. Uh, his carbon tax has not put a price on pollution. It has given a massive exemption to the country's largest emitters. Uh, up, uh, large emitters can receive an exemption of up to 90% of the carbon tax, but hardworking individuals pay the full cost, as do small and medium-sized businesses. And as it relates to the LNG plant, that the only reason why it was allowed to proceed was because it was given an exemption from the carbon tax. So the only way you can get big projects built in this country under the Liberals is when the Liberals don't apply their own policies. Of course, Conservatives, I support LNG projects that get our natural resources sources to f foreign markets that also displace dirtier foreign sources of energy. We can do more to lower global emissions by exporting more of what Canada does so well. Ms. Bain. We have to move away from fossil fuels as rapidly as possible. Our policies are science driven and I'm afraid neither Mr. Singh nor Mr. Scheer understands and neither Mr. Trudeau understands climate science because if they understood the peril we are in right now as a human family on this planet, the need to hold to 1.5 degrees Celsius means you can't proceed with we the Trans Mountain Pipeline. You can't proceed with LNG Canada, which by the way isn't Canadian. It's owned by mostly multinationals from Asia, including PetroChina. So when Bill Morneau gives them $1 billion in tariff waivers and then they pump $220 million into the project and they claim there's 10,000 jobs, guess where 5,500 of those jobs are? In the fabrication plant in China. So we are subsidizing a project that will blow through our carbon budget with 125 megatons of additional carbon. That's 125 million tons of additional carbon. It doesn't matter how good Mr. Horgan's rhetoric is on climate. This project is a climate killer. The jobs that we are subsidizing are being created in the People's Republic of China. It should be stopped. We have, we have a fair bit of time to discuss all of this, but I do want to open up a little parenthesis and ask about the issue that Ms. May raised. The tariff waiver for Chinese steel to build this project. Mr. Singh, uh, Mr. Scheer. Uh, a horrible decision. I mean, we're seeing that our own Canadian manufacturing sectors are being horribly impacted by steel dumping. Steel dumping is essentially flooding the market with steel that is of a lesser quality, the environmental restrictions aren't there. It displaces good paying quality jobs here in Canada. It's something we've got to do much more to attack. Uh, without any measures to challenge the steel dumping, it could seriously continue to threaten jobs in the manufacturing sector for steel and aluminum here in Canada. Uh, one of the things that I was deeply concerned with was that Mr. Trudeau com completely disregarded the steel tariffs that threatened a lot of jobs, steel and aluminum tariffs and instead signed an agreement with a country while they still had illegal tariffs imposed on us. We've got to change our approach to make sure we've got manufacturing in Canada that's strong, that's supported. That's our commitment. So will you come Mr. out against Shearer, LNG on, Canada? On the, on the steel waiver, so on the tariff waiver. I can agree with Mr. Singh that it was uh, very disappointing uh, to, see, uh, Donald, uh, to see Justin Trudeau sign a deal with Donald Trump after conceding so much without getting a, a solution on steel tariffs. And then when it finally did come, it still gave a lot of flexibility to the U.S government to put those tariffs back in. As it relates to LNG, the reason why the federal government, the explanation that we were given by these Liberals uh, on the subsidies that they gave the project was to compensate for the differential on steel. And then they turn around and lift the waiver, uh, the, the tariffs anyway. So we got the worst of both worlds. We had to put in the taxpayer money to compensate for it. That Then the tariffs were lifted and the Chinese steel is able to come in. This is just another point of weakness on Justin Trudeau's dealing with our difficult situation with the government of China. He's put money into the Asian Infrastructure Bank, building roads and bridges to help the government of China expand its influence in the region, and he's taken this move on the steel tariffs as it relates to LNG. So another okay. example where Justin Trudeau can't stand up think, for Canadian workers. Yeah, I think what we need to do when it comes to manufacturing, one of the things we proposed, I went to Thunder Bay and I met with the workers who, who no longer have a job. Many of them received layoff notices because they couldn't continue to produce their amazing products in Bombardier and Thunder Bay. Now, at the same time, Canada spent a billion dollars on a contract to buy uh, in our publicly owned train sector to buy trains from a German company. And I've said that that's completely irresponsible. To use public dollars to fund other countries and their manufacturing sectors is irresponsible. What I would do to those men and women that are working in Thunder Bay, to the people that work here in Canada, is say this. If we're ever spending any public dollars, we should spend that money on a uh, 
procurement process that requires made in Canada content. That means ensuring that we support manufacturing in our country, that workers who work so hard have a future where they know they can rely on investments by Canada I to just, support manufacturing in Canada. I just wish you supported the steel workers at Everest Steel in Regina that make the steel for pipelines. I just wish you supported the steel workers in Hamilton who also sell products into Absolutely. the energy when sector. You, no, you don't. You, those jobs won't exist if we don't have development projects in this country. That's just a simple we fact. We just have to no. respect the reality that we're facing climate crisis and we've got to make better decisions. When you leave we can that, put those no. great when workers, you, when you leave our those natural incredible workers, we can give them opportunities. The moderator will move along, thank you, to the second question, which goes to Elizabeth May. Ms. May, a pillar of your plan to fight climate change is to retrofit every single building in Canada to make them all carbon neutral in just 10 years. The economist Andrew Leach says that means getting 7 million homes off natural gas or heating oil, and that both electricity and housing stock are matters of provincial jurisdiction. How far do you plan to get with this, working with Jason Kenney and Doug Ford in implementing your audacious plan? Well, let's just make it clear that the adjective could be audacious, it could also be essential. If we are driven by the science, and we really don't have a lot of choice here, you can't negotiate with physics, there's a carbon budget, and our atmosphere is at a point where no, no other party seems to understand this. I'm, with all due respect to the gentleman on stage with me, no other party has put forward a plan that comes remotely near what we're required to do. And the downsides aren't environmental problems. This issue still is misrepresented as though we're worried about the environment. I'm worried about the survival of human civilization through the lifetime of our children, because if we go above 1.5 degrees Celsius global average temperature increase, we're looking at the risk of runaway global warming, of self-accelerating, unstoppable, catastrophic changes, which no civilization can survive. So yes, we can do this. It's all hands on deck. And I believe that even those who are recalcitrant at this point can be persuaded by the science. And if they're not persuaded by the science, we work with the municipal order of government where they totally understand this issue and the provinces that want to. And by the way, to our friends back at Rotary, we need to call out to Canadian civil society. Who wants to put a solar panel on your own roof? Who wants to plant a garden? Your Who wants argument, to help us plant trees? Your argument is that no other party and no Canadian government recently has operated uh, with the kind of ambition that the scale of the challenge requires. Correct. Is there a, country, a government in the world that that is stepping up? In Sweden, your, in Costa Rica, uh, Denmark, the UK has done way more than us. Most of the industrialized countries that were within the Kyoto Protocol are already far below 1990 levels. We're still far above them. We're required globally to go 45 percent below 2010 levels by 2030. That's a tough challenge. It's not business as usual. It's not politics as usual. That's why I've written to both Jagmeet, Andrew, and Justin to say we need an interior cabinet that focuses only on this because we can't I have, stick to status quo decision making and save ourselves at the same time. I have so many questions, but my piece of paper says that it's Jagmeet Singh's chance. Thank you very much. You know, uh, Madam May and I agree a lot. Uh, it's absolutely important to be driven by the science. We absolutely believe that we can change the direction of our country if we make the right investments and fossil fuel subsidies. We can invest in in clean energy, renewable energy. We also really strongly believe in retrofitting homes and buildings across this country, creating hundreds and thousands of jobs. We envision at the minimum 300,000 new jobs being created. We agree on a lot and we know that we need to do this. And Ms. May knows that our plan is one of the boldest plans to tackle climate crisis. But Far there's a couple of points ours, there's a couple of points that we disagree on. You know, when it comes down to it, our, the Green Party and, and New Democrats share a lot in common except for the following four points. When it comes down to it, we have a solid position, unlike the Greens, on a woman's right to choose. We have a solid position when it comes That's down to true. national unity. We have a belief that we can't leave <laughs> workers okay. behind, and we strongly believe that we should not be putting Mr. Scheer in the prime minister's seat, unlike Ms. May in the Green Party, who believe that's the right choice. Excuse Mr. Scheer, on the question, those, and then... Those so, were absurd so, statements. Uh, I'm awfully sorry. <laughs> well, I think we're going to parse that a little more closely uh, yeah, in a minute, yeah, but Mr. Scheer, you, said. Mr. Scheer <laughs> you go first. You said. First and foremost, I think it's important to understand where we are right now. We have, with Justin Trudeau, a failed approach that has proven not to work. CO2 emissions are going up and his carbon tax is making everything more expensive. It's making it harder for Canadians to get ahead with this carbon tax. We've seen in British Columbia emissions going up and nationally we're falling further and further behind. Our environmental plan, the Conservative Party's plan, my plan, helps make life more affordable while we lower greenhouse gas emissions. I do agree with Ms. May that 
as buildings are an essential part of fighting climate change. That's why we are introducing a green home renovation tax credit that will allow Canadians to invest in their homes, to upgrade their furnace, to replace their windows while getting a generous tax receipt, lowering their energy costs, helping them get ahead and lowering CO2 emissions at the same time. Excuse me, That's I'm exactly not, our plan. I'm not going to, I'm sorry, Jack, me, I had to listen to your absurdities. You're going to have to stop now. The only Mr. Sheer, it doesn't no, really sorry. believe uh, that climate change actually are, exists. Ms. Ray does get a chance to I, respond. I'm afraid, I am not going to go down the little rabbit hole that Mr. Singh just created. People can check, none of what he just said was true. But we are talking about a carbon budget. We need to work together in this country to ensure that global average temperature increase does not go above 1.5 degrees Celsius. We signed that commitment. That's the Paris Treaty commitment. So far, for targets, Mr. Trudeau has kept Mr. Harper's target. Mr. Scheer would keep Mr. Harper's target, which is approximately half of what needs to be done. 30 percent below 2005 by 2030 is half of what needs to be done. And your target, Jagmeet, is 38 percent. We need to reduce by 60 percent if we're serious. Now, it's not easy, but it is possible. We have to marshal all our resources. We will be putting millions of people to work in this country, transforming our economy and giving our economy a boost that it really needs in new investment. And Ms. May said something that I agree with. You can't argue the physics. Right. And part of the physics is that a molecule of CO2 does not need a passport to travel around the world. And that's why my plan is the only plan that talks about taking the climate change fight global. No recognizing recognizing that Canada can do more to sure. lower global emissions by doing more of what we do at lower emissions rates like making aluminum and exporting clean Canadian technology. There are 3,000 electrical plants in China. If just 100 of them used Canadian carbon capture technology, we could lower emissions by 300 the problem, megatons. The problem is that you is don't the have type a target. If you don't have a plan. I am the only leader, clear that we can the only leader talking about taking the climate change fight global. To tackle climate well, crisis as well, well as creating opportunities for work. There's a way to do both and we're committed but to doing that. But we have to take it global. I've got, about one final, I've got one final and round of prepared questions. Work together. If I, can I just do say, have a question for Mr. Shear, but I want to ask, we're essentially getting into the territory of, 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 of who could form an acceptable government in the eyes of those parties that might get to choose that. Mm -hmm. Ms. May, you've said that you would not support uh, a minority government led by any of the other parties. And I Mr. Would, Singh, you've said that you would not, not support a I'm conservative sorry, minority? What I said was, and, and I know how these parliamentary negotiations go. I'm, I have colleagues in green parties around the world who've negotiated various governments, served in cabinets around the world. And, and in fact, of course, my colleague Andrew Weaver negotiated a government for British Columbia. But the bottom line for Greens isn't about power for us. The bottom line is whatever parliament is formed at the end of the next election must be committed to holding to 1.5 degrees Celsius, which means massive transformational okay. changes that start now. And no one else so far, I think they might change their minds in negotiation. Their current policies don't cut it. And, and so if, if the Conservative Party has the most seats but doesn't commit to 1.5 degrees, what's your response as soon as Parliament convenes? We wouldn't vote for them in a confidence motion, even on the speech from the throne. Okay, and if that means that Justin Trudeau gets a chance to form a minority government with fewer seats than the Conservatives, that, you're okay with that? Well, the majority of Canadians by far have for decades been asking for climate action, and what has stalled it has been the short-term partisan interest of political leader after political leader. It's time for some courage. It's time for some bravery. It's time for saying this is what we must do for our kids, so we will do it. Mr. Singh. Which parties would you and would you not support in a minority situation? Well, I'm, I want to make it clear. I believe that climate crisis is something we've got to take seriously. I'm committed to real action. Mr. Trudeau has said a lot of pretty words, but hasn't really delivered any real action, and he's failed on that front. So our position is clear. We would not support Mr. Scheer. Uh, it's his position on his lack of clear position on uh, women's right to choose, on LGBTQ communities. Um, you know, for me, that's not debatable. For us, we want to make it really clear. We have a solid position on those fronts. Okay. It doesn't seem that the Green Party is very clear on their position. Very Our position clear. is okay. very now clear. Have, we support national I unity. I we support that, a women's right to choose. And we're going to fight to make sure that we build a brighter future. I believe we've point. just kicked off a debate that's going to go for the rest of this campaign, so I'm not going to indulge it any further tonight. Mr. Shear, you get the next question on energy and the environment. Mr. Shear, you have opposed carbon taxes because you prefer regulation of heavy industry. You would force businesses that exceed their emissions targets to invest in clean tech. But in 2014, Stephen Harper said that with energy prices low and the United States letting their companies off easy, quote, it would be crazy economic policy to do unilateral penalties on that sector. 
We're clearly not going to do it. If he wouldn't do it then, why would you do it now? I have my own plan. I've unveiled a real plan for the environment. It is the most comprehensive policy ever put forward by an opposition party. It contains over 50 specific measures that will explain how Canada can reach its international obligations. It's built on a number of pillars, technology over taxes. You are correct to say that we are going to require large emitters to pay into tech development funds. This has been a proven method of actually lowering emissions. There's an example of Gibson uh, Industries in Saskatchewan, which used a similar type of green patent tax credit that I am proposing to lower their emissions. They invested in a new type of technology that allowed them to increase their output while keeping their emissions low. This is what we have seen all across the, the economy in Canada. When you focus on technology over taxes, you actually get results. The carbon tax is proven to fail. I don't know why anybody would support a policy. It's not a Conservative Party position. It's not my opinion. We are falling as a country further behind our targets under Justin Trudeau's carbon tax. It will only work if he increases it as he is threatening to do. After this election, if Justin Trudeau is elected, he will make your life less affordable by ramping up that carbon tax. Elizabeth Bain. We need massive investments in energy infrastructure in this country, and they need to be investments in an east-west and reaching north electricity grid so that Canadians are no longer driving internal combustion vehicles. We, I looked at your plan, Andrew, and it is long, and it does include some good things. I won't say it doesn't. It's got money for Great Lakes, looking at Lake Simcoe. Lake Winnipeg is right Greening now an ecological grid. crisis. Greening the grid. So we have some Home things there. Tax but credit. listen, there's, there's one thing that is absolutely essential in any credible climate plan and that is hanging on to human civilization by making sure we hold to no more than 1.5 degrees celsius and we need to understand the window on that opportunity closes soon and if it closes and we haven't gotten to the other side of that through global leadership that's where the global part of what canada should do is is that we are still respected in the world we punch above our weight if we get our own house in order and say look we were dependent on fossil fuels but look at us now we're going off fossil fuels by 2050 we're cutting our emissions by 60 percent by 2030 our economy is booming as we move into this enormous range of economic opportunities but if you don't have the right target you can't make a plan that makes any sense One and no no one in this election has accepted the target that science requires. Yeah, one brief question no, before haven't. we go to Mr. Singh. No, you haven't. Yeah. Elizabeth May, you said that that window closes soon. When is soon? According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, whose reputation, by the way, is that when they're wrong, it's because they underestimate the impact and overestimate how much time we have. So I find it very alarming. As the international community heard their report on October 8th, 2018, people said this is the alarm bell that we can't ignore. Everybody else has hit the snooze button. If we don't ensure that global emissions are 45% below their 2010 levels by 2030, the opportunity to hold to 1.5 degrees Celsius global average temperature increase will close and, and it my, doesn't and reopen ever. And my plan is the only plan that I takes the climate change fight say, global. You know, we all know that it's very serious. We've seen the impacts of, of climate crisis in the lives of Canadians. We've seen massive forest fires, the worst that we've ever seen. We know that it's impacting people in eastern Canada with floods on the record that we've never seen, homes being washed away. And when you see and meet with people who've had their homes washed away, it's heartbreaking. So we know we have to act, but we have a lot of opportunity here. Anytime we're faced with challenges, there's a great opportunity. We believe we can put 300,000 people into great, solid, sustainable jobs if we tackle this crisis. We can retrofit homes, we can end fossil fuel subsidies. There's so much that we can do. We can electrify our transportation, invest in public transportation. I know here in the city of Toronto, people need that desperately. We can get people a better way to move around, which emits less emissions. There's so much hope and so much uh, opportunity. We, we just have to seize the opportunity right now. We know it's going to take a lot of courage. It's going to take bold conviction, but we can do it. There's so much opportunity you sound, here. We've we're got going to be to, committed to it. You sound almost like a green, but you won't take a target. That we believe, what's, we've got, you've got 38% 38, 38 reduction. Keeping, keeping it to 1.5 degrees, we know. But and, then you have lower. to adopt the 60% below. We know it's going to take a as significant with, cut. As with so many, right. It's going to take a big cut. As with so many other topics tonight, the, the advantage of having debate nice and early in the campaign is that I think we've actually uh, set the table for discussions that are going to take place for the entire rest of the campaign. That concludes, you may be relieved to hear, our discussion of environmental issues. I'll be back in a moment, but let's take our final break and check in on reaction to our debate so far. 
Thank you, Paul. Three topics in, and you are definitely chiming in. I want to bring in the poll results for the last one here, and that was, does a leader's debate performance affect how you vote? Overwhelmingly, 64% saying yes, 36% saying no. Does this debate perhaps change your mind? I want to bring this in here for you. What question would you have asked the leaders? Because we are running out of time here. If it doesn't make it to broadcast, we, of course, will be doing some one-on-ones and some scrums with the leaders. So maybe we can get your question in there. You can chime in on Facebook as well as on Twitter. I want to see what else you're talking about. I'm going to bring in Dilshad Berman, who's part of our digital team here at City, and Aaron Brindle, who is a trends expert with Google Canada. Uh, start with you, Aaron. Sure. What are most people Googling right now? Sure. So I, people are Googling the leaders, obviously, and we're seeing a tremendous amount of interest in the prime minister, the person who's not in the debate tonight. Mm-hmm. Uh, we saw that peak actually in the first few minutes of the debate, I think, with the empty podium probably generate a lot yes. of interest. Uh, the top question people are asking about Trudeau over the course of the past hour, where is Justin Trudeau? Where is he? And we know he's in Edmonton. We'll bring you more on that in just a bit. Dilshad, overwhelmingly, a lot of people are saying something that we thought, you know, we have three leaders here they'd have more time to talk. What are they saying about that? Well, most people are wondering why everybody is talking over each other. It seems like they keep interrupting each other. We've got a lot of comments saying, oh, it doesn't look like they respect each other very much. And people are sort of calling into question the leaders' leadership style based on their behavior that they're seeing on air right now. So that's become very interesting. They're kind of judging them as potential leaders of the country. But so is a debate, right? Absolutely. That's how it goes. Okay, so we'll check in again with Dilshad and Aaron in just a little bit. Meantime, we're heading over to Montreal. City News reporter Tina Teneriello, group of students right now, talking about the environment, what they think about what the leaders have been saying. Tina. Yes, thank you so much, Melanie. We're at Dawson College, and we are with students who have been taking to the streets to demand that government take action to fight climate change. We're talking tens of thousands of students that have been protesting this. It's been one of the biggest turnouts around the world. In fact, the Swedish teen climate activist Greta Thunberg even got their attention, and she's going to be coming to Montreal for a protest at the end of the month. And we're joined by some of the students who made this happen, who reached out to Greta and asked. So I want to ask you, Marwan, uh, I, I saw that you were actually laughing sometimes during this mm-hmm. debate. So yeah. what do you think? Which leaders, are, are there any leaders who impressed okay. you? Well, honestly, I have seen a lot of chatting, some fighting too. Have I seen the needed courage and leadership to tackle this really important crisis? I'm not sure of it. However, I have seen one candidate who was a bit living in his own reality with, where there is no hurry, no crisis, and it's the conservative leader. Is there one uh, issue here that you wish they would have addressed that they did not address? Yeah, party leaders, they don't seem to realize that uh, economic growth is not sustainable in the long term, that we live in a world with finite resources, limited resources, and we cannot grow indefinitely. And what about you? What is the most important issue when it comes to the environment during this election campaign? So it's not about one or many issues because it's not about getting close to meet the IPCC targets. It's about meeting them or facing what science unanimously describes like an unprecedented global catastrophe. And why do you think that Quebec youth are so mobilized to fight climate change? Because if we look across the country, Quebec is really standing out, Montreal particularly. I think we have developed a culture in which we are conscious about the global impacts of climate change. We are fully aware of it and we're ready to fight it. And that's why under 27, we're going to take on the streets and send the message. The environment is our number one issue. And on the 27th, they're expecting a historic turnout. The mayor is going to be participating. Uh, Some schools actually canceling classes. I want to do a survey now with the students in the room. Raise of hands if you feel that the leaders in this portion of the debate addressed your environmental concerns. Put your hand up if you feel they did. Ooh, two, two hands up there. All right. Thank you so much, guys, for participating. And we have people watching this debate right now participating that are even too young to vote. So it just shows the engagement uh, of youth across Canada. Over to Cynthia Mulligan now in Toronto with our political panel. All right. Thank you. Amanda Galbraith, is Andrew Scheer doing what he needs to do to take on Justin Trudeau? I think he's started. He's one of the few leaders we've seen kind of go back to attacking Prime Minister Trudeau over and over Consistently, again. Consistently. Yeah, which I thought we'd see a lot more of. So I think he's doing what he needs to do. It's surprising to me the leaders, the other ones, have not kind of gone at him as much. Andre? I would say that it's a little bit surprising to me that uh, uh, Scheer is going uh, after Trudeau, when I think his, his largest threat is actually the NDP. 
like for a lot of Canadians, you know, their their biggest issue is this the looming climate disaster. Mm -hmm. And on that front, uh, Sheer and Trudeau are not really that far apart. I would say like it's Roger Spencer from the uh, the Greens and the NDP. So I don't know that that is necessarily his uh, his biggest target. All right, Lisa Kinsella, weigh in here. Well, I, I think uh, there's been a lost opportunity here. You have Justin Trudeau, who's not at this debate tonight, and I think it took what about 40 minutes before anyone really started going after him. So when you have this effectively, because both Singh and May have essentially said that they're not going to win this election, what Scheer should have been doing is focus, focusing his attacks on Trudeau as opposed to arguing with the other leaders. And John. Quick moment there, though, when uh, Singh, after going very effectively after Andrew Scheer for much of the night, turned his, trained his sights on Elizabeth May, which is a reminder that the NDP has to pull back some center-left votes from that have drifted to the Greens recently, and that's another important mini-fight mm. within this bigger battle. All right, thank you. We'll continue watching right now. Back to the bait and Paul Wells. Stephen Harper used to describe the world as a sea of troubles that Canada needed to avoid. But nowadays, the trouble doesn't bother to stop at our shores. With Canadians detained in China, conflict over tariffs and values with President Donald Trump, and trouble in Kashmir, Venezuela, and the European Union, in a moment, we'll debate Canada's place in the world, but first, City News reporter Travis Prasad with the events that have rocked our reputation in the world stage and how they've impacted sentiment on Main Street. In Saudi Arabia, an already strained relationship collapses. This is Rafah Altima, a very brave new Canadian. As Canada calls out the regime's human rights record and the Saudis respond by severing ties. In China, relations sour after the arrest of a Huawei executive in British Columbia at the behest of the U.S. The swift Chinese response includes the detention of two Canadians and economic attacks. He learned that's going to cost a lot of money for the people of Canada. And with our largest trading partner, name calling and a roller coaster relationship with the U.S. president. But after tense negotiations, a new NAFTA, signed though still not ratified. Was it a success? Depends on who you ask. These are the Chabertin Estate Vineyards in Langley, British Columbia. Brian Enser's winery makes 54,000 cases each year. One third are sold in BC grocery stores where BC wineries have exclusive access. I think it has been a bit of a boom because access to grocery store shelves and any shelf space is great. But that will soon change when U.S. wines start pouring in under a new deal that Enser feels the Trudeau Liberals made under pressure from the Trump administration. Losing shelf space uh, to some small and boutique wineries could be crushing or fatal to the business, depending on how they've situated their, their sales. Enser says that while his business can withstand the change, he still can't see the impact of Canada's foreign deal making as a glass half full. First question on foreign affairs goes to Jagmeet Singh of the NDP. Mr. Singh, while a lot of my questions have been on very specific files, this one's a bit more general. The fastest growing foreign policy challenge facing Canada, Canada today has to be China. We want trade and investment ties that are good for the Canadian economy, but we worry about human rights and the rule of law. How would you reconcile or at least balance these conflicting values? Well, thanks for the question, Paul. We have to do exactly that. We've got to balance the interests. And if you look at uh, the track record so far, you know, we all hope that with Mr. Trudeau, and I can admit that I hoped as well, that it would actually truly bring Canada back on the international platform. There was a lot of difficult years with Harper, who had really embarrassed Canada in a lot of ways. Now with Mr. Trudeau, it's the same thing. There's been a mess of the, the China situation. has been a, a complete debacle. Uh, India, the trip was also uh, a complete mess. And now we've negotiated a trade deal that makes it worse for workers. It makes it worse for farmers. It makes medication prices go up. And in general, what we're seeing is, again and again, this uh, emphasis on making life easier for the people at the very top and harder for everyone else. Uh, I would approach trade as a free trade is not the way forward. It makes corporations benefit. I'd approach it through fair trade. And with China, uh, same idea. We have to make sure that we have a consistent approach that balances our need for economic development, but that does not create an unlevel playing field for our workers who cannot compete unless there's equal environmental rules and workers' rights. Elizabeth May? I have to say that anyone who gives an answer confidently saying they know what to do with China isn't telling the truth. China right now and Canada's relationship with China are imperiled by some rather large forces that are outside of our control. Donald Trump is 
poking China with a stick and creating a trade war. We are caught in the middle. The arrest of the extradition uh, request for Huawei Executive Meng Zhu has created a situation where our number one concern should be, as much as I'm concerned about China stopping canola imports and turning down our hog products, the number one concern must be the safety of Canadians. Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor should be our concern right now, not Sorry. trade, not anything else. And that means that Canada's diplomatic relations with China China have to deepen, have to show that we are serious about working with them. We are in a situation where anyone, as I said, anyone who says there are easy answers here is, is, is talking out of their hat. It is a very difficult situation. Donald Trump is difficult and unpredictable, to put it mildly. Meanwhile, but People's Republic of China is a country which shows no respect for human rights. It is not a, obviously, it, it is a totalitarian dictatorship. And thanks to Stephen Harper, we're bound by the Canada-China Investment Treaty so that every state-owned enterprise from the People's Republic of China that operates true. in Canada Sheer, is so, under the so threat of are, Chinese there retaliation. Are some, there are some very specific things that a government can do to stand up for our interests, something that Justin Trudeau has failed to do. This uh, conflict with the government of China has been going on for months now, and it was only in the last few days that Trudeau took the step of even naming an ambassador. There is no reason why it took him that long. Also, we can show resolve. We can stand up for ourselves. And as Prime Minister, I will pull the funding from the China-run Asian Infrastructure Bank. I do not understand, Canadians don't understand, why their tax dollars are being sent to build roads and bridges in other countries that China has the ability to influence. I would also start to uh, take the steps necessary to show China that when they start blocking our exports that we will stand up for ourselves. But I will agree with you, Ms. May. The two Canadians who are held uh, illegally in China must be the focus of the focus of our concern. We need a reset in our relationship, and it starts with having a prime but, minister that stands up for but Canada. But if you cancel fossil fuel subsidies, which Stephen Harper promised he would do in 2009, it would have an effect on dozens of state-owned enterprises from the People's Republic of China, like the partial owners, PetroChina, Kitimat, owning part of the LNG project, Canada LNG, it's called. Have, We're throwing $220 million I at have that. Been very clear, I've been very clear that I do not support a free trade deal with China but at this time because, because, of, because, a, of, because of the role of state-owned enterprises but, in their but economy. But we're already committed, thanks to Stephen Harper's no, that, cabinet, you're, you're which passed it under royal prerogative. You're misunderstanding what a foreign oh, investment really? protection act means. No, I'm afraid you haven't gives, read the gives, Canada-China uh, investment gives, treaty. It gives Canadian businesses and investors the same types of protections. No, it doesn't. It is the, it, it is froze essential. in no, time. It's essential. No, no, you we have can't to read, do business with another country. You have to read Sold if Down the Yangtze. investors don't have the same Yeah, you, the same you need to read what those who understand this agreement. It froze in place all of the discriminatory practices towards Canadian enterprises while giving the People's Republic of China state-owned enterprises the right in secret tribunals to bring charges against Canada and seek arbitration damages and the first six months under this agreement lets them lean on us in diplomatic forms in, in closed doors behind uh, closed doors that, uh, the the situation right now with with two canadians being detained in china in deplorable conditions uh, is something that we've got to focus in on it's something that requires all of us working together to ensure that they're returned safely that they're treated in a dignified and humane way there's been lots of concerns about that that should be a focus but when we talk about trade i think it's important whether it's with china or any other nation we've got to look at the goal of our trade deals. So far, the trade deals that I've seen have focused on free trade without really benefiting workers. I grew up in Windsor, and I saw what free trade did. Unfettered free trade without protecting workers meant that the kids that I went to school with, their parents used to have great jobs in the auto manufacturing sector. They lost those jobs, and they're struggling because there wasn't a focus on making sure workers have a good opportunity. Free trade. That's got to be We're a focus. We're even subsidizing projects that trade. outsource We've thousands sure of jobs. Fair trade. Free trade. Good jobs for workers. Onwards. Free trade with the United States creates billions of dollars of economic activity creates well-paying jobs for hundreds of thousands of Canadians all Might across the country. The people at and the top, you, but it doesn't help people every day. The, we see the, our manufacturing sector has been auto hollowed sector. out. You talk to the people yeah, who are let's, making parts. Uh, I, I feel this one petering out a little bit. So okay. let's, uh, let's go on to the next, uh, the next question. And it's for Andrew Scheer, the leader of the Conservative Party. Mr. Scheer, in 2017, you wrote on Twitter that you were pro-Brexit before it was cool. Are you still pro-Brexit now that it isn't? 
I'm always in favor of, uh, of countries being able to uh, chart their own destiny and control uh, their own uh, internal affairs. And it is now up to uh, British lawmakers and the British people to determine what happens next. My focus is on restoring Canada's place in the world. We just talked about the difficulties that we're having with China. It's no wonder that the government of China doesn't take Justin Trudeau seriously. After he clowned around in India and after he accepted concession after concession after concession to Donald Trump without getting any wins back for Canada, it's no wonder it? that Canada has lost its place in the world under Justin Trudeau. I will restore the dignity of our country represented abroad by standing up for Canadian interests and representing Canada with strength when we face difficult encounters. When you respond, Mr. Singh, I hope you'll stay on Brexit at least for a bit. No, for sure. I mean, this is a, an issue where we're seeing that uh, if you negotiate deals, uh, deals that work in the benefit of people that, that live in the country, uh, we've seen massive benefits to having free-flowing trade between the European nations. They've done it in a way that's created benefit for workers. It's been beneficial for, for the people. Uh, that's how we've got so to focus on, on trade. trade. Uh, we have to make sure that it's done in a way that's fair. And, and what people have, have to strike the balance in Europe, they've done a good job of trying to strike the balance between uh, making sure there's a free flow and people are able to to have commerce, but doing it in a way that doesn't benefit the people at the very top and allow them to enrich themselves, but does it in a way that actually helps working people. And that's my focus. And with any but trade deal, it's got to be a focus. A yeah, let's talk it's got to be a focus on, on workers. Yeah, I just say, Brexit is a tragedy of enormous proportions. What's happened to our colleagues, the Parliament of Westminster, the people of the UK is disastrous. The whole, and I want to get to something, it may sound like I'm leaving Brexit, but Brexit was a manipulation of public opinion through the invasion of the privacy rights of Brits from things like Cambridge Analytica. It was mining data and making up lies that perfectly fit the people who would then hear those lies. So the referendum was won through deceit. We must, I mean, I hope and pray that my colleagues in the Europe, in, in the British Parliament, and I do have one Green colleague, Carolyn Lucas, that they find their way through this because Boris Johnson's bullying efforts will not work. Thank goodness the Parliament you know, at Westminster uh, and its House of Lords managed to stick with the fundamentals that he couldn't pull the plug and call an election. No one's tried this, that in the British I, Commonwealth I, I, since I Stephen wanna, Harper. I do want to get back to you, Mr. Shear, and there's a reason why I asked this question besides that it was a pretty clever way to phrase it. Um, and I want to stick up for the guy who's not here. Justin Trudeau has written out this whole three-year process, and the result has been that when he meets a British Prime Minister, he is rep he's seen as the representative of a valued ally, Canada. Mm -hmm. And when he meets European uh, leaders, whether in, Br in Brussels or in Paris or elsewhere, he's seen as a valued ally. By taking sides in a, in a question like that, do you risk jeopardizing half of that delicate balance? Well, keep in mind that Justin Trudeau himself expressed his position on the very same question, and that is uh, what prompted me to express my, my opinion. Uh, if we want to talk about positions that uh, leaders have had on different issues, I wish Justin Trudeau was here so I could ask him the question of what exactly about the basic dictatorship of China he admires. He said that on film, that when he was asked to pick of all the countries in the world, which country other than Canada he admired the most, he said the basic dictatorship of China. Now that we see what's going on and how he has handled Canada, I think we see a glimpse into his rationale on that. But I will always stand up for Canadian interests around the world. That includes being able that includes being able to sign a free trade deal with the European Union, as the previous Conservative government did, and in the eventuality with the the, the, Europe, the United Kingdom as well. That what is I'm something concerned that about, but not surprised about, Paul, is that you know when Mr. Scheer talked about being pro-Brexit and you know he's had some association with yellow investors. It seems That's to be this true. idea of this instilling fear in people and. Really, the fear isn't in new Canadians arriving. There shouldn't be any fear in using language like uh, defamatory language towards people who are seeking asylum because they're fearing persecution. Really, the reason why we're in a difficult position in Canada is because decisions have been made that benefited the wealthy and the powerful. Now, corporations continue to enjoy massive loopholes and tax benefits that everyday people don't have. That's where we should put our focus, not on the idea that new people coming to our country are somehow a threat. And that's kind of the sentiment behind why Mr. Shear uses the the type of language true. around being pro-Brexit, being closely affiliated with yellow things. investors. These You're are the type of things, things that up. instill fear. We believe in opportunity of coming people come sure. together. That's just, that's just absolutely not true. The Conservative Party and I will, as Prime Minister, uh, continue to ensure that Canada has an immigration system that welcomes people from all around the world. 
we must do so based on three important pillars. Our system must be fair, it must be orderly, and it must be compassionate. That is that has been my position, and it is very disingenuous is, is for you to so try you to revoke the safe that at all. third country agreement with the United States. When, when, right when now, people, we're sending people, people away, and to, in the House, I've heard you say it, Andrew. You act as wait. if people are illegals when they come here as refugees. Under when international refugee Canada, conventions, people have their every right to come and claim refugee status. May, I'm sorry, I think there's nothing compassionate about forcing people to wait long who are in refugee camps in places where there is civil war, where they will be killed if they leave those camps, where they have to wait longer because some people are skipping the line and jumping the queue no, and coming into camps. There is no queue for refugees. There is no queue for refugees. I think what we've established here... I think what we've established here is that my invitation to discuss Brexit did not go over well with this crowd, um, and that's fair. There are so many issues in foreign affairs I tried. that it sounds like you could you could have a whole other debate on foreign affairs. And I'm given to understand that there's a project like that on the table. I'm not and sure if Justin Trudeau will show up for that either. Well, I hope uh, yeah, he showed up for people in four I, I hope it, I hope uh, it continues. Uh, whoever shows up, we've got one last question in this whole debate. Um, it goes to Elizabeth May of the Green Party. Ms. May, you've called for shifting Canada's focus and funding away from NATO. But given Vladimir Putin's military muscle flexing and the other strains on European unity, doesn't NATO increasingly look like a pillar of the peaceful post-war order that Canada should be doing everything it can to support? I think that the question is based on uh, a twisting of an answer I gave to a colleague at CBC, perhaps. It was based on we, your interview with Vashi Yeah, Kavanaugh. what I yeah. said was that our interest in NATO should be to transfer NATO's interest mm -hmm. towards nuclear disarmament. We have a real threat to global survival. The only thing that can outpace the climate disaster as a threat to human survival is nuclear war. Canada has not signed the UN treaty to abolish nuclear weapons. We are part of NATO. NATO is a shared defense alliance, but we need to make sure it's working in the interests of the, our future, and that means we need to engage NATO to be part of an effort to counter this the disastrous situation that Trump and Putin want to undo the work of Reagan and Gorbachev. Okay. So this is a significant concern. We also believe that the Canadian military should be properly funded. We don't have surveillance on our no, Arctic shores. We don't have anyone there to intercept Russian vessels that land, and they do okay. land. People Two come current, ashore, and we have absolutely no capacity to deal with that. Two current elements of Canada's current NATO policy. One is the Canada-led battle group in Latvia. Mm -hmm. You support that? We would review all of our NATO commitments because we also need to sure, ensure we have the resources to pull ourselves out of 59th in the world as a contributor to UN peacekeeping. We need to operate within UN-sanctioned efforts where there are real crises around the world and hot spots where we're not pulling our weight. 59th in the world for peacekeeping isn't good enough. So the we would review, plan, not pull out. The other is the plan to increase uh, military spending by about half to, to get closer to meeting uh, yeah. NATO uh, targets? The, NATO targets aren't as important to the Greens as the target that was accepted by Canada to 0.7 percent of our GDP to overseas development assistance. Peace and security in the world is much more won by ensuring that girls are educated, people are fed, and that the festering hotspots of the world get the effort to keep a sustainable peace in place. We have to be the anti-Trump in the world, and that means not flexing military muscle half as much as making sure we meet the SDG Sustainable Development Goals. Andrew Scheer on Canada's NATO commitments. Well, I believe it's essential that Canada is a full partner in NATO, and that means meeting uh, our targets for, uh, over time, getting to that 2 percent target. It's essential that we are there to show uh, support for our allies. There are dangerous areas throughout the world and throughout Europe as well. We've seen what's happened in Ukraine. As the government of Russia, uh, Vladimir Putin's regime has ignored the sovereignty of Ukraine and, and, and is in the process of, of annexing part of, of, of Ukraine. I wear as a badge of honor that I am the only party leader who is currently banned from entering Russia because of my support for Ukraine. A conservative government under my leadership will ensure that Canada is supporting Ukraine with real materials that will help them uh, fight against Russian aggression. We will also ensure that we meet our targets. And I have to note that under Justin Trudeau's leadership, Canada has not been able to give our men and women in uniform the equipment they deserve. We are now in a situation where we have purchased we have replaced our 40-year-old CF-18s with 40-year-old F-18s from Australia. He has completely bungled our procurement process for our armed forces. I will fix we it. We may agree on that, but I think in fairness, we should also acknowledge the bravery of Christian Freeland, 
who, as our Minister for Global Affairs, is also banned by Putin and used to live and well, work in Justin, Russia. She took quite a lot of chances. Justin Trudeau, but needs, your to explain, foreign Justin Trudeau needs to explain why he attempted to normalize relations with All the I Putin regime. Is, I wish he was if here. I looked at your policies on foreign policy today, Andrew, and I realized if anyone wants to know where you stand, just figure out what Trump wants. That's because you want to move our embassy to Jerusalem, take our role away as being an honest broker it, in that part of the world. You nice. want to join with the U.S. and build an anti-ballistic missile sorry, system. So you will do what Trump wants. You might Mr. as well be, he might as well be the ventriloquist and you're Charlie oh, McCarthy. That's just false. Well, I mean, look at the let's get, let's, let's give Shapiro a chance to respond and then Mr. Sure. No, sure. look, I have continually advocated for Canada to be a full partner uh, in NATO. I believe that we should not sign away our sovereignty on our foreign affairs, which is what Justin Trudeau did when he signed NAFTA and conceded a huge concession to the United States on future trade deals and on exports of certain Canadian uh, products. I believe that Canada must recognize that in the conflict in the Middle East, there is only one side that tries to minimize human casualties, and that is Israel. We have an obligation to support the democratic state of Israel, the place in the region where people have the most freedom, and absolutely, I will be an, unapolog an unapologetic defender so it, of the right okay to It's not okay when Russia occupies Crimea, but it's okay for Israel to occupy Palestine. Just to pick up a, a point that Ms. May brought up, that you know, Mr. Scheer seems to be um, willing to do whatever it takes to support and continue Trump's policies. Uh, that, to me, does not show strength. If we want to be strong, uh, this is a massive failure of Mr. Trudeau. And I pick up on Ms. May's point. A massive failure of Mr. Trudeau is to not stand up to a leader of a country, Mr. Trump, who is stripping kids from the arms of their parents. To not call that out for the shameful act that it is shows weakness. And the fact that Mr. Scheer stands here today and is not willing to condemn Mr. Trump for his horrible treatment of other human beings, of other fellow brothers and sisters, is another example of how he is no stronger than Mr. Trudeau and cannot provide the strength of leadership that we need. We need someone who's willing to call out if you injustices want to talk about, if you around want to the talk world. Will you call out Mr. Trump? I don't think so. You, you don't have to talk to do so. I do. You need to be strong. Okay. Okay. That means calling out let's, injustices. Let's talk about foreign policy. One at a time, is, and because he's taken a lot of accusations. Let's Andrew talk Scheer. about Canada's, dis, uh, Canada's funding under Justin Trudeau, funding UNRWA, a United Nations organization that is funding elements within the no, Middle East that foment, that foment yeah, and encourage no. anti-Semitism and no, they terrorism. Run that is in no. permanent settlement refugee here. camps for 70 years. I will pull the funding rejected. from UNRWA and ensure that Canadian taxpayers' dollars are not going to advocate terrorist activity. They're doing, they run schools, the reports, Andrew. Don't, I have been be so to the schools. The I reports. went there with 18 MPs from our Canada-Palestinian Parliamentary Friendship Group. And it is terrifying to see a small school where an illegal I'm sorry, but it's illegal appropriation of Palestinian land for giant infrastructure of a big community where there were soldiers in the olive the, the children throw rocks. The Israeli soldiers are there armed to the teeth. It is a terrifying situation. It's a humanitarian crisis. And the reality is Israel, it, and I stand there is absolutely four square for Israel, but Mr. Netanyahu's policies are a danger to the region. There is one side in the conflict that tries to maximize human casualties, and there is one side that tries oh, to minimize human casualties. Oh, that's, that's I will true. always that's ensure very, that Canada is there to support fact, it's wrong the to state of Israel way. and its right to exist. I was worried at the beginning of this debate that there wouldn't be enough uh, clear distinctions among parties. I think at the end of the debate, I don't have to worry as much anymore. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your contribution, everybody. Um, you've heard the debate, and now it's time for the final pitches for your vote. Each leader will now have 90 seconds to make a final statement. We've drawn lots for the order, and we'll hear first from Elizabeth May. Thank you, and I want to thank City TV and McLean's for all giving us this opportunity, you know, just barely 24 hours into the RIP period, who knew? And I also want to say to every Canadian who's watching tonight, please consider voting green this time. I will be enormously honored to have you give us a serious consideration. Look at our full platform, look at our policies, and look at the fact that we will be issuing a fully costed budget that has been reviewed by the Parliamentary Budget Office. We are serious about what we are proposing. We know Canada can do this. We can bring in universal pharmacare. We can ensure affordable housing. We can make sure our kids can afford to go to university by eliminating tuition. We can pay for these things. And we can stimulate our economy through a transformation that the, the likes of which Canada hasn't seen since we came into our own as a modern country in the era of the Second World War. The time for status quo decision-making is over.
the time for status quo, short-term politics, where every party goes out to beat their own drum and kick the others in the shins, is over. It's time to find common ground where we can work together because Canada isn't a country divided. We're one family. We care about each other. Every Canadian cares about an Albertan who's worrying about their job. Every Canadian cares about a British Columbian who can't breathe because of smoke. We care for each other. We have to think and work together like the country, the best we can be. Thank you, Elizabeth May. Andrew Scheer. This election is coming down to one simple question. Who do you trust to make life more affordable so that you can get ahead? Everywhere I travel in this country, I hear from so many Canadians who tell me that they're working harder and harder, but they're barely getting by. Life is getting more expensive, and Justin Trudeau is making it worse. He's raised taxes on over 80% of Canadian middle-class families. His carbon tax is raising the cost of everything from home heating to gasoline and groceries. And his massive deficits today will mean higher taxes right after the election when he doesn't need your vote, but he still needs your money. I have a plan for a government that will live within its means so that we can leave more money in your pocket because it's time for you to get ahead. I have already announced that I will cancel Justin Trudeau's carbon tax. I will remove the GST and HST from home heating and energy bills, and I will make maternity leave benefits tax free. And throughout this campaign, we will be unveiling more ideas, more policies, more proposals that will put more money back in your pocket for you, for your kids, or for your retirement. What we know is that we cannot trust Justin Trudeau. He has broken promises, broken the law, and lied to Canadians about it. And his policies will make life more expensive. Ours will make life more affordable because it's time for you to get ahead. On October 21st, I'm asking for your support so that we can restore ethics and integrity to this government and improve and lower the cost of living for all Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Shear. Jagmeet Singh. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, folks, for sticking with us this long. Um, when we look at Ottawa, we look at the governments in Ottawa, and we look at the decisions they've made, whether it's been liberal like Mr. Trudeau or before that conservative like Mr. Harper, the decisions that governments make have always seemed to benefit those at the very top, the powerful corporate interests, and have made life harder for everyone else. So I ask you this simple question. This election comes down to this question. Who's going to fight for you? Who's going to stand up for you? New Democrats, we're not in it for the rich. We don't work for the powerful and wealthy. We work for you. So we can tackle the problems that we're faced with, the problems like housing. We can tackle unaffordable housing, the housing crisis, but only if we have the courage to take on money launderers and speculators and invest in building half a million new affordable homes. We can tackle the problems when it comes to medication, people who can't afford medication. We can expand our Medicare and include medication coverage for all, pharmacare for all, but only if we have the courage to take on big pharma and the powerful interest groups that don't want it. We can tackle the climate crisis and make sure young people have a bright future, but only if we have the courage to take on the big polluters and end fossil fuel subsidies. There is a bright future that's possible. You need someone who's in it for you. You Democrats don't fight for the powerful and the wealthy. We fight for you. We're in it for you. And on October 21st, I ask for your support so we can continue to fight for you, not the powerful, but for the people. Thank you, Jagmeet Singh. Well, that concludes the first debate of this campaign. I want to thank the leaders for taking part tonight, and I want to wish every one of you a good luck on the campaign trail. We've been inviting Canadians to take part in our discussions on social media, and that debate continues, as does reaction. So let's go back to City News senior political correspondent, Cynthia Mulligan. All right, Paul, thank you very much. Let's get back to our analysis here. Did any of the leaders here gain more voters this evening? I, I would say, and uh, I mean, you know, being the, uh, the the token commie on the panel, like <laughs> 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 you probably know that I'm going to say that uh, you know, Jack Meeting really shone in this uh, this debate, but he really did. He, he really I, did. I think Absolutely. going in, he had, he had the most to gain. Uh, he really showed himself. He, he uh, first of all, I think it was. Uh, uh, really effective of him to show what divisions exist between the NDP and the Green Party, because I think uh, for a lot of Canadians who aren't as familiar with those two parties, it's whichever, uh, you know, uh, whichever group turns you off the least is the one that gets your vote. And I think he did some really good work drawing a distinction between those two parties. What I loved in that last segment was when uh, Jagmeet Singh went after Andrew Scheer on the United States. 
and Sheer refused to criticize Donald Trump. And uh, Mr. Singh has, was talking about the children who were put in cages. That was a lost opportunity for uh, for Mr. Sheer for sure. And Jagmeet, absolutely, with with Justin Trudeau not there, he really shone tonight. Singh was good. He had one minor lapse. I did heard him much where he deflected a question on support for LNG in BC. Maybe people in British Columbia might have noticed that. I doubt it'll resonate very far. But I think he was the the clear winner here tonight. I, I guess the, one of the questions you have to ask about Andrew Shear is whether he could really afford to mix it up very much with the two people on the, in the studio with him because he, he really has to fight Justin Trudeau. So in a way, he was hamstrung in, in, in the way he could com be combative. There were some interesting dynamics, Amanda, going on here because Singh needed to pull votes away from the Green Party as well as Trudeau. Sheer wants Singh to do well mm -hmm. because it's in his best interest to pull votes away from the Liberals. How do you think that all played out? Yeah, I think what we saw was uh, Sheer was looking at the camera, right, speaking directly to voters, mm -hmm. trying to kind of be calm. Like, he had a very even tone throughout the debate where you saw Singh sort of mix it up a lot more. So I think that's why we had him. He wanted to be prime ministerial and waiting, right? And you have to be the calm guy at the fight. You don't want to pick a fight with a third party because you don't want to make them more relevant. Um, I agree. I thought Singh did much better than I anticipated he was going to. I actually think... Is it enough to jumpstart his campaign because they've been struggling lately? I think people love a comeback, right? So we've already seen some of this narrative of them building up. I think it's going to be fascinating to see Singh versus Trudeau in the debate, yes. right? Because like basically we just had a practice round and how they're going to go at each other. So Sheer needs to stay calm. I think a little more emotion out of him would have been good. And I think hopefully they keep kind of Elizabeth May, you know, not too mixed up, but I thought Sheer did what he needed to do. Singh did very well, and you know, we'll see. Interesting to think now, of Sheer Justin Trudeau, sorry, Cynthia, watching this and thinking, okay, I have to watch out for Joby Singh, obviously. Well, he I mean, he gets a, a good preview what of, of what their yeah. styles are going to be. You know? Now, let's talk about how Sheer consistently de de uh, moved the dial over to criticizing Justin Trudeau. We're just going to run some tape on that, some examples of how he was always taking it back to slamming. Justin Trudeau. Justin Trudeau promised that the budget would be balanced. I think we can all agree that Justin Trudeau is afraid of his record. We're also going to eliminate wasteful liberal spending like the $250 million that Justin Trudeau sent the Asian Infrastructure Bank. That is Justin Trudeau's corruption scandal. He is the only prime minister that has ever been, ever been convicted of breaking the law and he lied about it. So I want to use this opportunity to again call on Justin Trudeau to do the right thing. We are falling as a country further behind our targets under Justin Trudeau's carbon tax. So the key question, was that effective? Did it hurt Justin Trudeau tonight? Not attending? Not attending, but what, yeah, what Sheer attacked. was trying to do. Listen, I think what Sheer needed to do was talk and attack Justin Trudeau and talk directly to voters, which we saw him do consistently. Um, I think, obviously, Trudeau's presence would have been a little easier to do that, but you know he had to keep that sort of level head. Uh, I'd like to see him mix it up and get a bit more aggressive, um, but I also think we needed to see, like, where was Jagmeet Singh kind of going after Trudeau? He really turned his guns on Sheer a lot more than I thought he was going to. Right. Mm -hmm. Why don't we pull up Justin Trudeau? He was speaking in Edmonton. We'll just... Even though he wasn't here, we're going to give him a little bit of a say tonight. Conservatives like to say they're for the people, but then they cut taxes for the wealthy and cut services for everybody else. Other than deciding that they might need to smile more, they have no new ideas for Canadians. They still think you can cut your way to prosperity. But as Canadians know, that's the wrong approach to take. That's why we chose to move Canada forward by investing in families, in workers, and in communities, and by having faith in Canadians. So that is a familiar refrain by Justin Trudeau. He's invoking Doug Ford, talking about for the people, which Doug Ford uses that phrase all the time. Only Jagmeet Singh. Jagmeet Singh brought up the specter of Doug Ford here, who is the Achilles heel for Andrew Scheer in Ontario. Do you think that, were you surprised that Ford's name wasn't mentioned more, John? A little bit. It's interesting that it's not just Ford, right? Justin True in ads and other points, he's, he's running against Ford, Harper, mm -hmm. Trump. You know, as, uh, he mentions them as much as he does directly uh, Andrew Shear so far. So it's it's an interesting kind of dynamic where we're really seeing him thinking. Obviously, that Shear's persona isn't as well defined as the three people he'd like to associate him with. Well, Lisa. if he had if he had been at the debate, then he could have differentiated himself from them more. <laughs> That's because true. The uh, the amount of corporate cronyism that, uh, that 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 Donald Trump is, you know, we're well aware of that. Um, if, if he'd been able to be at the debate, he could have explained himself a little bit on SNC level, and he could explain this explain the fact that. 
of the uh, Canadian families and corporations named in the Paradise Papers, now how many have been, pros been prosecuted? You know, how, how many of them are, are the, uh, the CRA publicly going after? But at the end of the day, I think Justin Trudeau was exactly where he should have been tonight, not at the debate, which is being held in Toronto. He already holds Toronto, so he needs to be out in other parts of the country where he can get in front of voters. We've seen it on the clip. He is a great campaigner, despite all the baggage he's lugging around. I'm going to have to pause it there, and we're going to throw to Melanie back in the City Newsroom. Mel. Thank you so much for that, Cynthia. I want to bring back in Aaron Brindle, trends expert with Google Canada. Yeah. What have Canadians been searching about over the last couple hours? Well, we saw some issues really break through this evening. Uh, probably the top trending issue over, mm -hmm. the, over the course of the debate was climate change. Kind of, the blue. Like throughout the entire debate, climate mm -hmm. change kept coming up. Um, SNC Lavalin issues related to SNC Lavalin obviously were one of the big was one of the big uh, issues that came up as well. And as you said, it was mentioned uh, more than once. More than once. More that's than right. once. Interest over time. When you do a breakdown, when it comes to time, you see certain pe uh, peaks and valleys. That's right. So what we're looking at here is a trends graph of Google search interest in the leaders, and you'll notice that red line kind of dominated throughout the course of the debate. Those are searches for Justin Trudeau, and you'll notice the peak was the highest at the very beginning, right when. Where is he? We, Yes, yes, and we saw searches related to where is Justin Trudeau. But you see that delta between Justin Trudeau and the other leaders begin to narrow over the course of the debate. And you'll even see Andrew Scheer, who's represented in blue, begin to eclipse uh, Justin Trudeau near the end. When we take a look at geography, Aaron, sure. uh, we break it down by region what people are mentioning and where. Yeah, so I think we saw the most amount of searches for Justin Trudeau out west this evening. Mm -hmm. He was in Alberta today, and you can see that as you begin to kind of scroll down, you'll see these searches where Justin Trudeau is dominated out west, whereas here in, uh, uh, when you look at Andrew Scheer, you'll see that he, you know, searches were kind of largest for him in Saskatchewan. If you keep scrolling down, you'll see that uh, Jagmeet Singh, you'll see popularity in Ontario, these sorts of things. So there was a fair bit of geographic uh, differentiation in terms of search interests. Absolutely. Uh, I should mention also on Twitter, uh, it was the number one trend all night long. In fact, I believe it's still trending number one across Canada, the hashtag first debate. And, and there, we'll break it down even further, maybe on social media outside of this broadcast, what exactly people were looking for when it came to the sure. leaders, because yeah. there's so much when it comes to these issues and the leaders themselves. That's right. Okay, Aaron, thank you so much for that. It's my pleasure. That. We're going to check in with Courtney Terrio now in Edmonton. Thank you very much. Uh, we are here on uh, Treaty 6 land, the uh, Enoch Cree Nation at the River Cree Resort. And uh, with six chiefs, uh, the quick question for you, we did an informal poll. Not one of you felt that Andrew Scheer took this evening. So the question to you is, what did he say or not say to fail to earn your support? Well, for myself, he, he, he answered the questions, but he wasn't uh, um, thorough in them. He was just kind of wishy-washy, and he didn't get right to the basis of the question. He should just answer the question and then go from there and be clear about it, and he, he didn't do that. Is that the consensus? Is some, do you guys agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, second question, it would be about uh, the empty podium. Tonight, Justin Trudeau, obviously in Edmonton, not at the debate. Uh, four years ago, he said that uh, he would uh, right a lot of the wrongs against Indigenous people. I think it's probably safe to say a bit of a mixed bag with those results. But how does he look tonight compared to what we heard on that stage? Well, I think he looks pretty good. He's here in Treaty 6 territory right now. And uh, he's the most searched leader at this point without even showing up. So he looks pretty good. Um, you know, the other leaders didn't stand out, especially Mr. Shear, who seems to even make himself look more detrimental when it comes to Indigenous issues. You know, Justin Trudeau, as, as much as he's struggled, he's still invested a lot of capital into different First Nations. And we see that. It's just not the story being told. But he still has a long way to go when it comes to Indigenous issues. But uh, at this point, uh, him not showing up tonight, he still looks pretty good. Is, is that the universal agreement here on the table? Yes. All right. Uh, and then one final question here. Uh, we've heard about uh, the United Nations Declaration. We heard about the Human Rights Tribunal. And there was cursory mention about uh, First Nation infrastructure. So those were the key issues tonight. But what do you want to hear over the course of the next 38 days from all four leaders with respect to Indigenous issues? What was missed tonight? Well, I think, unfortunately, what's always missed, not just tonight, but in past, um, we have something to say on every issue. We have something to say on economy. We have something to say on energy and environment. We have something to say on, uh, on uh, 
every issue that impacts Canadians in Canada, we're being marginalized by just being have one topic under Indigenous issues. I think we should be included on every topic, whether it's climate change, environment, energy, foreign affairs, we should be included in all that discussion. Well, and hopefully over the course of the next 38 days, that will be the case. Uh, a big thank you to uh, the Chiefs here from Treaty 6 for coming in tonight to have this discussion with us. Uh, hopefully this will be top of mind for Canadians as they head to the polls October 21st. Uh, that's it for us here on Treaty 6 territory just west of Edmonton right now. We'll turn things back over to Cynthia. All right, Courtney, thank you very much. One thing I would love to discuss with each of you is Bill 21 and the response to Bill 21. John. That's a tough issue for federal leaders because, frankly, the, the bill is popular in Quebec. And they and, and, and so, everybody wants the seats in Quebec. Yeah, so we heard some good talk, but not good declarations of intent here from people tonight. I mm -hmm. thought Singh is poignant on it for obvious reasons. It has to cut, cut close to the, to the heart for him. But uh, I don't think we're going to see anybody move very far on that because I think the polls in Quebec are clear. It's a popular measure in Quebec. It's a, it's a, it's a horrible measure. I, th I think mm -hmm. it's terrible that there isn't more outspokenness from federal leaders, but I don't see it as an issue that's differentiating the parties on the federal stage right now. Andre? Frankly, this is embarrassing. I agree. You know, what kind of country are we supposed to be exactly? Are we a country that, uh, that values diversity and multiculturalism and all these other buzzwords that we throw out? Do we actually value people's human rights? Do we believe that people should be able to freely exercise their religion to the extent that it doesn't harm anybody else? We keep saying that, and yet an entire province has declared that all those rights are null and void for you if you outwardly wear your religious expression, except one. That's absolute garbage, and I, I can't accept. I, I can't accept anything other than we are going to fight this uh, this oppressive move against people's human rights. Apparently, if we're you know if we're all Canadians, I, I think we should all be able to come to the, the same conclusion that if you are of a different background, race, uh, religion, creed, etc., then your outward expression of that marginalization or of that racialization or of what your religion is should not be punished by any sort of public agency, least of all the government that's sworn to protect you. Let's end. Uh, we just have a, a minute or so left on the SNC-Lavalin. Is it going to haunt Justin Trudeau and hurt him throughout this campaign? Well, I think he's been on the front page, right? I mean, the first day of the election campaign, there was more issues about it. Is it complicated? Yes. But I think we're going to see the Conservatives use it in advertising and maximize it. I think it's going to continue to dog Trudeau on the campaign His trail? polls dipped considerably over the summer, but they have gone back up. Do you think voters have come to terms with it? I don't think they come to terms with it. I think they just there was less focus on it, right? And now I think there's going to be more pressure applied from the other parties. I think there's going to be more pressure applied by journalists. Obviously, the Globe and Mail has not given up on the story. Mm -hmm. I'm going to guess there's more to come. All right. On that note, thank you very much to my amazing panel here. We are going to wrap up. Thank you so much for watching our election debate co-hosted by City and McLean's. You can watch online as the leaders now talk about how they felt they did during this election campaign on citynews.ca. Thanks again for watching. See you on election night, October 21st. comments criticizing other world leaders may set the stage for uh, impediments to foreign relations if you were to assume also. Office. I don't. I didn't say anything pejorative about anyone. The reality of it is that Pierre Trudeau used to make it very clear he didn't go along with U.S. foreign policy. U.S. presidents didn't like him very much. I have worked with world leaders. I know Mikhail Gorbachev. I know Bill Clinton. I think that world leaders will recognize Canada when they have a leader who actually understands diplomacy, international affairs, and at some point when someone like President Trump appears to encourage his own citizens to shoot immigrants, it's wrong not to let him know that that's unacceptable. And we need to revoke the safe third country agreement with the U.S. Mr. Mayor, don't you want to seem more interested in debating Justin Trudeau tonight? He didn't really seem to engage with either you or Mr. Singh, barely looked at you uh, often. Uh, why do you think that was? Well, I think because all of us want to debate Justin Trudeau and hold him to account for, I don't call them broken promises. Uh, electoral reform wasn't a broken promise. It was a massive betrayal. 
But I did feel that we engaged with Mr. Sh Mr. Scheer. He wanted to deny that his foreign policy was written by Donald Trump. I think it's outrageous to suggest that Canada would lose our possible role as an honest broker in the Middle East by following along with Trump and moving our embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. That's a very bad idea. Mr. Mr. Yeah, on, on, Bill, on Bill 21, none of the leaders on the stage were willing to endorse a federal intervention on a bill that I think you all agree is, is a, a huge issue in terms of freedom of religion. Is that not just because you're all seeking